Hey everybody, this is Eric Center of KISS, and guess who you're listening to? Yeah, that's right, you're listening to The Cashers More Show. What's going on guys, Cassius Morris, aka That Reporter Get Here, and you're listening to The Cassius Morris Show. I am your host. Today is Saturday, December 13th, 2014, for another 10 minutes, and I'm coming to you guys from the Basement Broadcast Center in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Did I mention it is 11.52 p.m.? I think I did. Um, today is episode 11 of The Cassius Morris Show, and this is not not going to be a long intro. It's going to be just a couple really, really quick things. First thing is we're now sponsored by a new sponsor, Please make them feel nice and welcome. Onnit.com. It is a human optimization company, and they have everything from kettlebells to supplements that make your brain feel nicer, um, to protein powders, nutritional foods, anything you can imagine for human optimization is at onnit.com. So go to cassismorris.com and click on one of the Onnit banners. And uh, anything you order through there, you get a discount and it supports the show. So that's cassismorris.com and click on the Onnit banners. Today's guest is Mr. Eric Singer from Badlands, like you just heard in the beginning. He was on that Badlands record 25 years ago. It's already been. I say that like I was alive. I wasn't. Uh, he's currently in Kiss, as you all know, and he was with Alice Cooper, Black Sabbath, Brian May, and many more bands. We talked a little bit about all of those bands in this interview. We also talked about it was all mostly KISS. Uh, not only was it KISS, it was just a look at the music industry in general, what it's like to be in the music business, what it's actually like. A quote from the interview is, it's called the music business, not music friends. And I'm sorry I said quote so Canadian there. But it's true, and that's what Eric explains. He talks about KISS. We talk about what Eric would do if he was faced with the decision of staying in the band with new members, a.k.a. replacing Gene or Paul. We talk about Kissteria, if there was any truth to it. And we took listener questions from Facebook.com slash Cash's Show. And you can always go like that Facebook page for the opportunity to ask your favorite uh, musician or actor or YouTuber or podcast or whatever a question at Facebook.com slash Cash's Show and on Twitter at Cash's Show. And of course, my personal Twitter at Cash's Morris. A little thing that I'd like to add, and this is a complete shot in the dark. I know that this is going to be posted on Kiss Online, Kiss's website most likely. So while I still have the attention... Mr. Gene Simmons, if you are listening to this podcast, I have been trying to interview you for almost seven years. I'd say five of those years, I deserve not to get it. But I feel like now that I'm improving, maybe I'm a little bit older, I have a documentarian who would like to film me interviewing you for a documentary channel. You're going to be in Calgary uh, for the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp this coming month. And if you would be interested in speaking to me for even 10 minutes and you end up hearing this, uh, please feel free to contact me. I'm sure you can find a way to contact me somehow. So just putting it out there, folks. It's a shot in the dark, but uh, I'm sure that would be very interesting. So I'm going to play you guys the Eric Singer interview, and I'm not even going to come back at the end just because we have two hours of incredible content and that's not, you know, toot my own horn. It was incredible for me to hear as a fan. And I told Eric this in the interview. For those of you who don't know, and maybe this is your first time listening, I did a podcast about Kiss called Creatures of the Net for uh, six years. And I just recently finished that. Every single episode was dedicated to Kiss. My entire room in Halifax, my entire studio, everything is covered in Kiss. I've been listening to Kiss since I was six years old which is only 10 years, but listen, you do what you can when you were born in 98. There's a struggle out here, you know, you do what you can to survive uh, listening to rock and roll. But basically, KISS has been the biggest part of my life. KISS got me into podcasting. I've flown to another province specifically to meet KISS. And what can I say? They are my favorite band of all time. And this is actually the second time I've interviewed Eric Singer. I'm so glad that I got him again because the last time he actually surprised me and called into my live show completely out of nowhere. I was doing a live stream and he just messaged me on Facebook and said, how do I call in? And I said, I'll damn well show you because that's awesome. And he called in and I was, uh, yeah, probably about 13 at the time. So this is about three years ago. It might have been 12. I don't know. But I was younger and I sounded younger and the audio was terrible, but it didn't matter. It was uh, a member of KISS that was 
deciding to take the time to call into my show. So if, if you do want to hear that, it's on YouTube.com slash That Reporter Kid. Just look up Eric Singer interview. It's called Eric Singer Monster Interview Kiss 2012 or something like that. It has 20,000 views. So that's the one. And it's a picture of him on the drum. So go check that out. Everything you need is at CassiusMorris.com. And thank you for listening. And now let's get into a two-hour interview with legendary drummer Eric Singer here on the Cassius Morris Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. And rock on. Cassius Morris, how are you doing? I'm awesome, Eric. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to call in. It's the first time I've uh, had you on one of my podcasts since I was about 12. Do you remember that? Yes, that's when I first met you. And then you came to a Kiss show and... I took you and gave you a tour of the whole shenanigan and that whole thing. We gave you the royal treatment, if I remember correctly, up in Toronto. Yeah, absolutely. And then I got to meet you again in Halifax. Um, right. Probably... You came with your parents, I remember. You came with your parents. They were really cool. And and uh, your sister, I think, right? Yeah, all of them and my buddy Justice. Justin plays drums, I think, right? Yeah, Justice has been playing drums for years, and he's a huge fan. Okay, cool. So, um... I have to ask you a question first. Were you named after Cassius Clay? I was, yes. I thought so. You know, I, I don't know why. Right before you called, I'm sitting there thinking, because I started thinking like I did to you a second ago. Well, you need a theme song. You know, you need something <laughs> when you kind of, you need like bumper music as you're coming into your show. You need to have a theme song. Like, ladies and gentlemen, the Cassius Mars show. You know, like old school Johnny Carson. I just think it'd be funny and, uh, you know, everybody loved Johnny Carson and really identifies with that whole uh, not just him individually, but, you know, he was iconic, but the whole format of his show. I think there's a lot of people that miss that um, in, t- in television. Yeah. Well, like I say, uh, get in the studio and uh, record a demo and then we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> so no problem. starting off with um, some Kiss stuff here, actually, uh, this day in history, I'm not sure if you actually realize this, December 13th, 2005, the Rock the Nation live concert DVD was released. Um, I was just wondering if, looking back on that, do you have any uh, fond memories from that tour in general? I didn't know there was something to celebrate or mark on your calendar. Um, <laughs> I'm, being sar- I'm being sarcastic, but I'm like, really? I'm- I thought you were going to come up with, like, today was the day that you officially joined Kiss for the first time back in night, you know, back in... 1991, you know, because I remember it was like, it was actually around sometime like now. Um, I don't remember the exact date, to be honest with you, but it was sometime right before the end of the year that they asked, you know, that I officially joined KISS after our past play. Um, so that's what I thought you were going to reference at first. I was waiting for that, like, oh, your first, you know, it, your start with KISS. And I was like, oh, oh, Okay. It's the release of uh, Rock the Nation. Okay. Are you um, not a fan no, of that DVD? No, I don't. You know, I, look, I'll be honest with you. I'm pretty indifferent. Which okay. Is not to be confused with meaning I don't care because I do care. But when I say indifferent, it means it's like I'm, I'm, I don't get emotionally attached to any of this stuff, to be honest with you. I'm very happy of all the things I've done. I'm, you know, some things are better than others, and, but basically the big body of work, if you will, like all the things I've gotten to do and all the people I've got to work with, I'm really proud of it. I mean, but I celebrate it my own way, which means kind of more internally. I just kind of go, wow, that's really cool. Sometimes I'll sit around and reflect on somebody I might have worked with and go, wow, that's really cool because I remember seeing them as a kid and going to their concert or, you know, and buying the records, and now I'm working with them or playing on stage with them, and that's really pretty cool. But I always keep it kind of, I don't want to say suppressed, but I keep it kind of in perspective because reality is I'm not just some fan that somebody plucked out of the audience and goes, Hey, come up on stage and play with us. And I'm all (laughs) starstruck. I mean, I've been doing this quite a long time myself. And, uh, so I know how to get, but the point I make is I still know how to be a fan. I still know how to, I remember what it's like to be a fan and I still have all that same enthusiasm and passion. I just channel it differently than I probably did when I was a kid. That's all the point. But I still enjoy it, and I still see it through those eyes of being a kid and a fan like I always did, even to this day. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because it's like, for example, you know you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of yours, a huge Kiss fan, but that doesn't mean I can't sit here and talk to you like a, like a human being. Differing from when our last interview was, you know, I was a lot more starstruck because, you know, I was younger. So that's a good point. You know, you're – 
you're a grown man, so obviously you're not going to sit there and, uh, you know, starstruck over somebody, right? Well, I just never was that way. I mean, I, I was just having this conversation with some people the other day, and I said, you know, the whole time growing up, I was, I mean, really, you know, I was a music geek. One of those kids in school that's always talking about music, buying records, you know, mag- back then, you know, you had no internet, so it was magazines, and you'd buy records, and then you'd go to concerts, and that's the experiences you shared. There was very little exposure on TV other than maybe the Midnight Special or in concert, those type of things, or American Bandstand. So there was not too much format out there to get bands exposed, especially hard rock and that style, which was not mainstream, even though a lot of the bands were really big and popular, like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, Black mm-hmm. Sabbath, etc. But generally, a lot of that genre of music, or most of the stuff that I liked, it was not the main, it was never really the mainstream stuff, per se. Um, but I never had the, uh, I never had an interest in trying to meet any of the bands. I never went to the hotel to try to find out where he stayed or if I could hang out at the bar and meet them. I, I didn't care about that because I always thought like, why would some guys in a band want to meet a bunch of guys? <laughs> they don't. They're trying, they're trying to meet girls. So generally, why would they want to be the, you know, why would they want to sit around and talk to a bunch of teenage guys? You know, it's like, they're, they're not going to really be interested in that. Um, uh, and I think I was right. So I, somehow, I don't know what it is, if it was just instinct or whatever, I just somehow do. You don't need to go there. Just go to the shows and enjoy yourself. And I would go really early. You know, I'd be waiting outside the door when the doors open so I could get down there and be right on the stage or, you know, if it was a general admission show, you know, to get the best possible seat. And I also wanted to just kind of absorb and experience the whole atmosphere of going to a concert, which and part of that was getting there early. Um, sometimes you'd run into people, they didn't even live in your town. They might've lived, you know, another part of the city. Cause mm-hmm. I grew up in Cleveland, but you knew that you saw familiar faces like, Oh, I've seen that guy at shows all the time. This guy's had a lot of concerts and, you know, sometimes would be friend people, um, or at least have some kind of like common, you could tell, tell there was like a common bond with everybody. Even if you didn't know it, it was like, you know, it was a nod or a wave, like, Hey, you know, I see you all the time kind of thing. Yeah. Connected and by was, the music. There, yeah, exactly. And, you know, sometimes you'd be talking to, you know, like everybody, like we're talking now or people talk in chat forums or stuff like that. We, you know, in those days, you actually physically talk to each other, like outside the concert venue as you're waiting in line to get in. Maybe you're there a couple hours early and everybody's, hey, I just saw you last week and you were at Alex Sensation Long's Harvey Band concert. I saw you at Foghead or whatever. And you start talking about, oh, I went and saw Budgie. Uh, they were really great. Like, you know, I remember waiting in line to see Budgie, which was kind of a, they're kind of a more obscure band. Mm-hmm. And I remember people talking about how they had just seen ACDC in the same club the week before. Wow. This was probably 1977, six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. And ACDC started off by playing, you know, clubs like the Cleveland Agora. Um, like a lot of bands did. Cleveland played, I'm sorry, Kiss Pit played there, Rush, uh, you know, Dave, I mean, just about every band you can think of played the Cleveland Agora on wow. their way up. So you got lucky. And Yeah. But, um, Anyway, I know your original question was about Rock the Nation, and mm. like I was beginning to say then, um, I'm kind of indifferent about all this stuff. I think it's cool. Like I said, some things I look back on more fondly, or you know, other stuff I kind of go, eh, it could have been better or whatever. But honestly, I don't watch any of those long-form DVDs. Um, I know I tell people this, and I, they sometimes don't believe me, but I've never watched like um, – Kissology, one, two, or three. I've never watched any of them. I don't watch any of that stuff. Even the ones that you um, weren't even on? No, I don't watch them, honestly. Sometimes when we're making, for example, I'll get, let me rephrase this. If we're working on a record or something, then obviously I'm taking home reference tapes to listen to what we're doing, uh, or rehearsal tapes, because you're in the moment of making something, and you need to be in touch with it and, uh, and involved. But once it's done, that's it. It's done. I put it to, put it to bed. Because in my opinion, I really know what went on. I experienced it. I lived it and I did it. So I have those memories, you know, to myself. For a lifetime. Yeah, but but the thing is, I kind of know what it's about. Once in a rare while, I'll put on some old record that I might have played on just to see how it sounds. Because many times when you get way removed from something, you tend to develop like a new fresh set of ears. So you can hear it maybe from a little bit less emotional attachment and being less, you know, because I have a tendency to be way too hyper self-critical. 
and I'll really dissect stuff. And instead of just listening to a song or a record and enjoy it for its whole thing, mm-hmm. I start keep focusing on what I did on the drums or what I or I should have played this or I could have played that and I don't like the way this sounds or oh I'm not sure about that. And I sit there if it's very close after the time I've recorded it, I tend to have a hard time enjoying it or listening to it as just a song or just a record and a body of work. Right. And I find once you get further removed from it, then you don't have so much connection emotionally to it, and it's not so so uh, immediate or directly connected, meaning it wasn't recent. And then you can kind of go, oh, that's pretty cool, or I like that. Oh, that's not a bad, you know, that's not bad record, stuff like that. So occasionally... I'll put something that I played on on a CD player, you know, or something or in the car. Yeah. But generally, I don't listen to a lot of music, to be honest with you. Um, so, I'm a big sports junkie, and I watch a lot of uh, TV that's basically like, you know, the Learning Channel, History Channel, Discovery, those kind of shows. I don't really listen to just – I don't listen to music like I did as a kid where I was just obsessed with it. Put it that right. Way. It's not 24-7. So basically what you're saying is like – when you're making a record and it's like just come out, let's say when Monster came out, you listen to it the day after and you hear a little mistake that nobody hears but you, you're, you'll be kicking yourself saying, I should have changed that right before it came out. Yeah, or it might, for example, uh, especially in earlier days of recording when everybody was doing things analog, which means with like tape, two-inch tape, magnetic, magnetic tape. Yeah. Um, a lot of times people would do like, one take or another take, and they say, hey, I like the beginning or the first half of this take, but, you know, the outro and this other take's better, and they'll splice it together. And some guys became like, it was like surgery. You'd see them laying tape all over a room and cutting <laughs> and splicing, and sometimes you would create a new arrangement of a song by how you spliced a version or versions of a song wow. together or sp- splicing it up. And uh, everybody did that. Um it's very common, and sometimes I can hear the tape edit. I can listen to certain records, not just my own, but other records. If you go up, oh, there's an edit. You can hear where they splice the tape, yeah. and it's, it's very, it's audible. Other times they do it very cleverly, but nowadays with you know everything done digitally, or at least mixed digitally, uh, with and with Pro Tools, you can fix stuff up and make you know. Bottom line is, you can make anyone sound good. Unfortunately, it people have relied too much on a lot of the technology as opposed to using it as a they use it as a band aid, as a or as opposed to just using it to enhance something and fix something because it's no other way to fix it. I mean, originally when they first started coming up with you know digital recording and Pro Tools being able to fix things, they went, "Wow, this is so easy to fix now. Instead of having to go through all this tape splicing and stuff, we can just go boom, 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 paste and cut." Um, and they realized how much time is saved with therefore saved a lot of money when you're talking studio time. Mm-hmm. So the original advent of digital and all that stuff and Pro Tools was a great tool, but now it's become where people use it, I think overuse it. They overuse the technology and I, I want the human element to remain in the music. I want people to play live and and play, you know, without necessarily with click tracks and all that all the time. Just play real. It's okay to let the music move around and have it breathe, you know. Um, I have to say, the last two KISS records we did, we played live. And, um, of course, we used some Pro Tools stuff for, for for mixing and things like that or fixing a little glitch here or there. But, for the, but we recorded that stuff live as a band. We sat up in a room and put on headphones and... You know, we had we did our pre-production by meaning we rehearsed the songs and had the arrangements worked out. Mm-hmm. And we'd get in the studio and we'd run a we'd rehearse it once or twice to make sure we all knew what we were playing, and we'd make sure we had a tempo. Sometimes we'd re, we'd refer to our rehearsal tape for the tempo. We'd put it on for a second, go okay, that's the tempo we're going for, and then we just play and we'd play it live. And uh, but all all of Monster and all of um, Sonic, Sonic Boom. Boom were done live except for one song um back to the stone age was the only song that was played to a quick track and that was only done for one reason it's because we literally wrote that song in the studio that day on the spot we had an idea for a song and i remember i came up with some ideas how to change it and she's like yeah that's cool and, and we were just you know we literally wrote it like in the moment so we we're going to record it and i just said hey guys you know something It'll make it a lot easier since we haven't rehearsed this song and we just came up with it right now. You know, usually you rehearse stuff or you have time to sleep on it or absorb it. 
we didn't get that chance. So I said, why don't we just, to save time, to make it easier, because when you go to play live, quick caches, everybody has to get a decent performance. Yeah. Even even though you're usually going to just keep the drums, if the drums are good, sometimes you can go back and then fix, punch in and out, and pick, patch up the bass or a guitar part, or just redo it. But you're really trying to go for drums initially, because the drums is like building a home. You you pour the cement and lay the foundation. That drum track is the foundation to begin the construction of a song. Right. So in that particular case, we said in that particular song, we just said, why don't we just do it with a click track to make it easy and not waste a bunch of time? Because we, we, would, we could have ended up spending you know, all day trying to get the right take because nobody was really familiar with this new song idea. Mm-hmm. So we did the right so we did the right thing and we just said, Okay, let's let's um do it with a quick track. Otherwise everything else was done old school. And I think it all sounds great. And you know, back to the Stone Age, that's so crazy that you guys wrote it that day because I think it's one of the best songs on the record, um, especially the bass riff. So going back to what you were talking about a few minutes ago about the fans, how you never wanted to meet, you never really cared to meet uh, the people you looked up to as a kid. Um, well, it's not, it's not, let me rephrase it. It's okay. not like I didn't ever want to meet him or wouldn't have thought it was cool to meet him. I mean, I remember, I'll give you an example. One okay. time I went to the Cleveland Agora to see UFO. Mm-hmm. And we got there early like we always would. So the place is open. There's nobody, you know, we'd always be, most of the shows I went to, uh, Cassius, I usually, with my friends, was one of the first ones in the venue. So I'd be there really early walking around. Like I said, it was all about absorbing the vibe and being part of the vibe. Because, you know, to me, I wanted to be in a band. I wanted to do this. I wanted to do what I was going to see. So to me, I used it as like, hey, I'm going to school. This is like, this is like going to college for me. Uh, you didn't have rock and roll schools. You know, mm-hmm. there's no way to learn how it is to really be in a band. You have to do it. And part of the the actual hands-on application of doing so, sometimes you just need to be around the environment. You need to absorb it. You need to experience it, see it. And that's also another way to learn. Aside from actually physically playing, sometimes being around it, you learn from watching too So and listening. So I remember we went there early and, you know, I was sitting around in like in this one hallway and I remember Phil Mogg and Pete Way from UFO come walking by. So we said, hey, how are you guys doing? You know, and they, you could, they seemed, I don't know if they were drunk, but they kind of, now when I look back, I think they were a little bit tipsy. <laughs> because, but, but they were English and they were kind of like, you know, you know, a lot of English people are very, um, a very dry sense of humor. They're, they're very sarcastic. They always make a lot of funny one-liners, what they call like Cockney stuff, where they do, do all this Cockney rhyming. And they just say a lot of funny stuff. And I hadn't experienced English people at this point. I think I was only about 18. So um, 18 or 19. But I remember we were asking him, where's Michael? We were asking him, of course, because Michael Schenker was the most popular guy in that band. And everybody, usually most of the people I know, we went to see UFO to see Michael Schenker. Yeah. <clears throat> and because um, he was just, a, you know, at that time, a lot of people, I don't know if they're aware of this, but if you go back and look at some of the old magazines, I think I think it was at Circus or whatever, they used to do like, you know, a poll, like, you know, they top drummer or whatever. And Michael Schenker used to win top guitar player. I think even in Guitar Player magazine back then in the, like around 76, 7 or 8 or something like that, over Jimmy Page and all these other really big name guys, Michael Schenker would win favorite guitar player by the reader's poll. That's crazy. Because he, he, he was a real guitar hero in that time, even though UFO was not a big band. He himself was a real bona fide guitar star. So, anyways, we asked him like, "Where's Michael?" And that was one of the only few times that I ever ran into somebody from a band that I was going to see or that was out touring and making records. I think another time I was in an elevator with my dad. We were playing a gig at one of the hotels in downtown Cleveland. For those don't don't know, I used to play in my father's band when I was a kid, and we'd play all kinds of every kind of function you can think of, from my like big band stuff to Oktoberfest playing polkas to ethnic music to weddings to ballroom dancing things. I mean, you know, I played every style of music. It's a lot of variety. Anyways, <clears throat> we played everything. So anyways, um, the, uh, the UFO, we were, go- yeah, well, we, no, we were in the elevator and I think um, there was another artist. You, most people may not know who he is. His name was Walter Egan. And he was a solo artist at the time. I remember he happened to be on the elevator when I was going um, coming down from the gig after the show, and I think he, I think he was getting on the elevator or something like that, 
he said, he, I, and I know he had just played the Cleveland Agora that night. And I remember just saying, oh, how was your gig? And he goes, oh, it was cool. And I remember I just, you know, I'm just, I'm just riding on the elevator with the guy. And, um, but those were very few couple in, instances where I ever crossed paths with any people from a band, you know. I just didn't go around that scene. Um, there was a bar or hotel called Swingles, Swingles Keg and Quarter, and it was a famous rock hotel in downtown Cleveland. And most bands, when they'd come to town, they all stay there. And okay. if you wanted to, you just could go to that bar and hang out in the bar. And every band, like if Kiss was in town, they'd be staying at that hotel and they'd be hanging around the bar. They had a lounge band that would play, you know, top 40 stuff or whatever, current music. And that's where a lot of people would go and hang out. Um, so you knew you the spots. To, Oh, I knew, yeah, I knew where I knew the spot, but I never went because I didn't. Like I said, I just didn't care about trying to meet anybody. You know, I always tell people this, and it, I know it's real easy to say after the fact, but my whole intention—I don't know why I felt this way, but I just always was like, I want to do this. I don't want to hang around this. I want to be in this. I want to do this. I want to be in a band. I want to play on stage. I want to do those things. I want to make records. I don't want to just hang around people that do it or right? make a record. I want to make the record. And I just had that mindset. As far back as I can remember, I just always felt like you could do this and you're supposed to do this. And I don't know why I felt that way. But it was something that was just inherent in me. But I just know that I've always felt that way. And you were absolutely so maybe right. That, well, maybe there's, you know, something. I, I, the only way I try to understand it is to say maybe that was some inner drive thing. You know, some people have a lot of drive or focus. Um, probably no different than how when I hear Gene talk about stuff like that. Gene always talks about how he was very driven and focused to be successful and all that. You know, coming from a foreign country, not being able to speak English and mm -hmm. having to deal with all that kind of stuff as a kid coming to New York City and to America. And, you know, um, he just, you know, he just seemed like he was always very driven and focused individual. And he is to this day. So, some people are just, you know, I like to think some people are just wired a certain way and they're sometimes wired for success, if you will, for lack of a better way of putting it. No, it makes sense. And, and it does happen for those people. And I find it interesting, you know, you telling me the story about the elevator because I heard a similar story about you. And I wonder, you know, my question is, is it crazy to think that one day you were the guy in the elevator saying hi to the guy in the band and now you have people, when they walk in an elevator with you, they go insane. Well, they don't go insane, but they, I, I, I know that, I know what you mean. It's kind of a mirror effect. It's a big moment will, for the, them. Yeah, but it's a, I know what you mean. It's a mirror effect of the same situation that we're describing. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing that made, I mean, I will admit, there's times where I think to myself, wow, there's some kid that really likes what I do or thinks of me the way I thought of my drum heroes growing up. And that's kind of, pretty insane and, and on one hand to think like wow there's actually some kid or kids out there that, that feel that way the same way I felt about like you know Tommy Aldridge or Cozy Powell or one of my drum heroes growing up so it's cool there's no denying it it's very cool yeah absolutely and and talking about see that story I heard came from the cruise and you know the Kiss Cruise for those who don't know I'm sure you all do is uh, Kiss does a yearly cruise now where they go and they sail with their fans for a couple days over to the Bahamas um, Paul Stanley was uh, talking about the cruise on an interview and he was saying how he was dreading the idea when he first heard about it being you know, stuck on a boat with all these fans. So my question yeah. is, how did, how did you feel before? Did you feel the same way? Um, I think everybody had kind of, of, you know, tentative feelings, if you will, because it was like, I don't want to say fear of the unknown, but we didn't know what you're getting into. And I do remember the very first cruise we did now, that was on a different boat. If most people that aren't familiar, we did the first one on Carnival Cruise Lines. It was a smaller ship, not quite as nice. And then they switched Sixth Man, the company that does the cruises. They switched to do, doing, from now on, to all of their cruises with Norwegian Cruise Lines. So we've been on the Norwegian Pearl for number two, three, and four. And um, the first one, it was more like a dorm where everybody stayed in the same levels and, and you know but the problem is it was cool but you couldn't get you know Kansas you couldn't go out of your room because yeah. every time you walked out of your door there was fans hanging right outside your door and then you know I think eventually the cruise line said hey guys you know if you guys just be cool you know back off a little bit let the guys and you know 
and the bands all enjoy the cruise just like you are. And, you know, it's cool to interact with them, but you got to remember this isn't a 24 hour autograph and photo session <laughs> because if you do that, they're not, why would they want to hang out? It's like, they're kind of, I know you're there to see them and it's a unique thing, but it really is kind of a, you know, quote unquote vacation for everybody. And it's a unique kind of a situation. And, but I, I can understand how some people might feel like, hey, if, if anyone's just going to keep wanting to take pictures with me and, and ask me to sign stuff all day long, why would I want to go walk around the boat? Because uh, not that you don't mind signing stuff, but you don't want to do that nonstop. Especially be so, trapped in a place where that's all you're asked to do. Like if you're walking around L.A., you might get the odd Kiss fan. But if you're in a place with every single person knows you, it must get hectic. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, you know what's, you know what's funny? Sometimes... For example, your schedule, you may have, maybe you're on your way to go do something. You're going to do a sound check or you're, you know, and they usually have people that work for the boat that do security and they take you around wherever you need to go to help facilitate to get to you, get you there in a more timely manner. You may one instance be on your way somewhere and somebody's asking you to take a picture of something you go, I can't right now. And then next thing you know, they're complaining to everyone, oh, that guy's an asshole. I asked him to take a picture with my daughter and he just blew me up. They don't realize he's got to be somewhere, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah, they don't know. Like maybe he's going. Maybe maybe he has, you know maybe he has an appointment for something. Maybe he has to sound check. Maybe he has to you know uh, whatever whatever that is. Nobody knows what a person's re- where they're really going or why, and they sometimes forget that you got to you know cut a little slack for people because if you, it's one thing if you're walking the street like you said in L.A. and somebody's shopping and then somebody comes, hey, how you doing? Can I get a picture or can I sign something? You go fuck off. All right, then you're an asshole. Yeah. I get it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but it's not like you say that, you know, I, I've never heard of you doing anything like that, but just saying no sometimes can have people complain on the internet. The internet is a big thing for kiss. And, you know, that's why I don't use any of those forums. Uh, by the way, do you ever look at those message boards, the kiss message boards? I have friends that sometimes send me stuff. Or if somebody makes, if there's some crazy topic or somebody says something, outlandish or whatever, or just funny, people send you links, you know, photos, links, all kinds of stuff all the time. So sometimes I have seen some of that stuff. Oh, yeah. And um, I have to tell you, you got to make sure you're not eating or drinking something sometimes because you will, like, (laughs) spit your food out or you will spit your drink out. Because some of the things that people say, I mean, as much as it maybe it's not so nice, but sometimes it's pretty damn funny. I got to admit. (laughs) Even you think so. Oh, come on. It's hilarious. Some of the stuff is so funny. Put it this way. Sometimes it's just very clever and funny. Other times it's so stupid and ridiculous that that's what makes it funny. I mean, it's amazing. You know, life is about perspective. We all can see the same situation in our own way or in a different way from each other. It's just the way life works. You can't, if somebody is hard dead set on thinking a certain way or feeling a certain way about something, even if you show them that they're incorrect or they're wrong, they're going to go like, who are you to tell me? You can't tell me how to think or you can't. I mean, it always turns into that. So people, they have their point of view and I get it. We realize that Kiss is a unique kind of a band. It has fans unlike any other band Mm -hmm. and that we love it. I mean, I love it. The Kiss bands are the greatest, but at the same time with that also comes some very, you know, slanted, obsessed, or or crazy points of view from people. And I get it. You know, you have a band that's been around for 40 years. You're bound to have people that uh, that like certain things and don't like certain things, era, band member, music, or whatever-wise related to the band. And that's cool. But you know something? Every band has that. You know, whether it's the beat. I mean, I, I personally love Queen. Now, I know there's people that really only prefer, like, say, the very early records of Queen when Freddie Mercury had long hair and he dressed really glam. Then mm-hmm. they hate that he cut his hair and was wearing shorts and had a mustache. It's like, bottom line is, Freddie Mercury was a great singer, amazing frontman and entertainer, and they had fantastic songs. And so, but uh, some people hated what they did later on with all the more pop stuff and all that. And me personally, because I like Queen, I like everything they did. I honestly do. I like all the things they've done. I saw them in the 70s. I saw their, their last concert, and I even saw the show. Um, I saw them with Paul Rogers and even with Adam Lambert. Wow. And, and, and I like, well, that's my favorite band, so that's with other, that would, to me, it's like, I'm not, I don't just go in with blind loyalty or blind love. I love Queen as a band. I love what they do musically. 
Um, Roger Taylor, to me, was one of my big influences as a drummer because not only is he a great drummer, he wrote great drum parts, in my opinion. He's very musical, his parts, his sound. Mm -hmm. um, he sang great. He's a, they all wrote hits. Every one of those, you know, Queen is the only band that ever, um, where every single member had a number one hit in England, not in the, not in the world, but in England, every one of the band members had a number one hit that that's they crazy. wrote. And that's the only, but not even the Beatles did that. They're the only band that's ever done that. And to me, they're a very uniquely talented band on so many levels. And, you know, obviously, am I biased? Yeah, because I love, they're my favorite band, so I'm very biased about them. But my point is, I've learned to appreciate everything they do. Do I like some stuff more? Of course. Some stuff I'm not really that a big a fan on, but I learned to appreciate everything they do, even if it's not my favorite thing they do, is my point. Yeah. Oh, I can relate to that for sure. It's like me with Kiss and, and The Elder. That's a big one. I mean, I it's not my favorite record. I don't listen to it every day. But once every few months, I'll throw it on, and I can say I appreciate that for what it is. So it, it all doesn't have to be... I stole your love. It all doesn't have to be the same thing or, uh, you know, a certain queen song. It, there can be some no, variety. You're, you're, you're right. You're, now, now, for me, when it comes to Kiss, I've always maintained this. As an overview, I've always thought, you know, there's certain records of Kiss or certain era that I don't personally like. I mean, my favorite era of Kiss is that very first three records. Yeah. The original band, Kiss, Hotter Than Hell, Dressed to Kill, and then Up to Alive. That's the era of Kiss that I grow, grew up on. That's the era of Kiss that had an impact on me and was influential to me. That was it. After that, I was not really impacted or influenced by Kiss anymore. As a drummer, I'm talking about as a, more, as a musician, as a drummer, whatever. I mean, that's how music works. You, I always say music is the soundtrack to your life, and it really is. You hear a certain band or a certain song, and you go, wow, I remember being in high school or going to prom or I remember when I had my, you know, like I'll, I'll think of, I could still remember, you know, buying those records when they first came out. And I, I remember first seeing the picture of Kiss in Rock Scene magazine in the back where it said new bands and a photo <laughs> of Kiss. And I was like, wow, this band looks cool. I went out and bought the record right away, the first album. I remember they came to town. They opened for Rory Gallagher at the Cleveland Agora. And I wasn't 18 then, so I couldn't go. Oh. Um, but my friend went and he took photos because his dad owned the club. His dad owned the Cleveland Agora. I went to, I went to high school with, uh, Henry Laconte is the guy that owned the Cleveland Agora and all the Agoras. His son, Dennis, who I think is now running for judge back in the, where I grew up, he, uh, he was, uh, a, a swim coach in, in, a PE, physical education. And so we'd always talk about music because he was always there working at the ticket booth or ticket box office at the Cleveland Agora. So he saw every band and I'd always pick his brain about, you know, who would, who had just played there and all this stuff. And I remember saying, Hey, do me a favor, take some pictures of Kiss. And he did. And he actually, a couple of years ago, gave me copies of those photos again, which I gave to Gene that he had taken at the Cleveland Agora that night. That was their first time they played Cleveland and I couldn't go, but they came back a month later and played the Allen theater when they opened for the New York Dolls. And that was in April of 74. So I'm, I'm one of those original, original Kiss fans from day one. Um, a lot of people discovered Kiss much later. I mean, the average fan, from what I've noticed, it seems like they're more from like the Destroyer, Love Gun, onward, they yeah. discovered Kiss. The Super it, Kiss it, era. Well, yeah, the, right. And to me, I lost interest in Kiss at that point because by that point, I was already about 18, 19, and I kind of started getting into like a lot of more fusion music and jazz and other kinds of stuff like that, progressive stuff. I was into, you know, like Billy Cobham as a drummer and, and, um, Ma Vishnu Orchestra and, uh, Return to Forever and, uh, you know, Kansas and Genesis, stuff like that. I started getting into a little bit more, uh, music that was a little more involved, not just about a show. Mm -hmm. And, um, and to me, Kiss was almost like, you know, they, to me, they were, they were our American equivalent of like a glam era band. You know, I love the glam era in England, you know, which was early Queen, David Bowie, Sweet, yeah. T-Rex, all that stuff. And Monty Hoople, I loved Monty Hoople. And America really didn't have that kind of bands really per se, if you will, the glam era. It was really more of a British English thing. And, but Kiss came along and to me, it was like, all right, they're repping the U.S. You know, here's our glam band, and boy, are they fucking glammy. Because mm -hmm. they were, like, pretty you – know, they came out with this look that was – I mean, they had the New York Dolls and some other bands trying to do that stuff, but nobody 
Um, nobody in America really broke through in a big way until Kiss came along. When Kiss came out of left field, you know, that was, uh, to me, I thought, like, finally we have a band in America that we can, that we can claim from this era or this kind of thing. I mean, you had Alice Cooper, and Alice was, you know, was uh, obviously, I wouldn't say he was glam, but he was definitely theatrical and slightly glam. If you look at Billion Hour Babies, the way the band dressed, they had a lot of silver, glittery yeah. lame, and um, the drum, you know, Neil, uh, Neil Smith, the drummer, had the mirror ball kit, you know. Um, very you know, there's showy. A lot of, yeah, very showy, but the thing is, they had the lit up staircase that Kiss later did on a live too. Alice had that on Billion Dollar Babies in 1973. There's a lot of things, you know, everybody influences each other. I don't like to say the word stole because you take something, you're, you know, if you see something you like, for example, you see somebody wearing a cool pair of shoes, you go, wow, I like those shoes. You go to the store and you try to find them and you buy them. But are you also stealing from the person? Are you stealing the guy's look because you saw something you like? No, you're influenced by it and you, you take it and then you make it your own. Yeah. And that's to me, I, I never thought Kiss stole from Alice Cooper. I thought they took what Alice did and, it, and, and, uh, enhanced it, if you will, and then they made it their own. They thought, oh, we can wear makeup, we can have a theatrical show, but we're going to go to another level and we're going to do, and we're going to do it times four. And that's what they did. Um, yeah, and, and it's not like that. They, you know, it's not like you're right. It's not like they were looking at Alice's billion dollar baby's blueprints and saying, "Okay, how can we copy it the best?" They were their own thing, and they were very showy. I wanted to know about the reunion that Kiss did in '96. So you did the unplugged show, and um, Ace and Peter met with Gene and Paul, and they had a bit of a reunion there. And then Kiss decided to do the reunion. So when they did that. And you looking kind of from the outside at this point as not a member of the band anymore. Um, did you see a farewell tour in their future when they did that? Well, no. At the time, no. I mean, the way it started, we obviously started doing, um, we were doing limited shows. And we started doing those KISS conventions. And the first ones we ever did were in Australia. Actually, Perth, Australia was the very first one. And, you know, we realized, hey, this is kind of a cool thing. In Australia, we did them before we played concerts. Uh, I mean, I should say also it, with concerts, we weren't doing just a convention tour. We were doing a kiss convention, but we were also playing shows. So yeah. We're doing a kind of almost like what we do now, where we do a meet and greet, where we play acoustically, you know, but a much more organized. Um, in other words, it was a, a separate kind of a game ent entity, if you will. It was on a separate day. It wasn't the day of the show before the show. We would actually do these on a different, a separate day, and then you'd have the regular concert, um, like the next day. Um, and then they decided, hey, we're going to go and do this, you know, around the country, and we're going to make a little Kiss museum. We're going to basically do what the Kiss fans had been doing on their own, doing Kiss fan expos. But we're going to do it, mm -hmm. and we're and Kiss is going to appear there, and Kiss is going to play, and we're going to do it unplugged because obviously the MTV unplugged format had become very popular and so we just kind of you know that's what like like all things everybody influences each other or whatever is going on at a certain time people tend to kind of all do it yeah um and it was a cool thing i mean th those that mtv unplugged series was a great thing i think there was a lot of cool music and performances that came out of that so anyways we started doing it um and i remember we played but we did the one in burbank and and, and i know that you know, people want to tell different versions of this story, but the, the real story and the truth is when we went to play Burbank or Cal LA area, Gene called me up and said, Hey Eric, um, Peter Chris wants to come down to the expo and you know, he wants to bring his daughter because his daughter, you know, we never experienced anything to do of kids, whatever, you know, Peter had done in his career. You know, she was, I guess, I don't even know what year his daughter was born, but she w didn't experience any of the KISS stuff mm -hmm. in makeup and all that. She was either a baby or not even born. So at this point, we're talking 1995, he wanted to be able to come and show his daughter, like, hey, you know, this is part of what I did. This is your dad's background. And Gene's like, like, do you have a problem with that? He actually called me to ask me how I felt about him coming down. And I said, no, I don't care. I go, why don't you have him come up and play or sing? Okay. And now some people have disputed and some, well, some people said, oh, that Gene just made that story up because it makes it sound like 
you know, to make either Kiss or Eric look like a nice guy. <laughs> That's not true. The truth is exactly what I told you what happened. That's how it went down. Gene called me up just respectfully to make sure I didn't feel uncomfortable. And I'm the one that suggested, why don't you have Peter come up and play? And they did. And Peter came up and did Hard Luck Woman or Bath or whatever. And it was a cool thing. And I thought it was cool. You know, there's YouTube videos. I thought it was cool because you got to remember, like I said, I was a Kiss fan as well growing up of, the, of that original band and that original early era. So um, those are um, sometimes you can't forget to be a fan. You can't put your ego aside and enjoy it. And I did. And then, um, but some people tried to claim that I was being, dis that that's disingenuous and it's all fabricated, but no, that's exactly the way it happened. And he came down and then Bruce Kulik always told me that he always knew and always felt that there would be some kind of reunion at some point. He always saw it in the cards. Mm -hmm. And um, then there started being talk about um, those guys. The MTV took interest in the whole thing the conventions and asked us to do MTV Unplugged. And then they reached out to, G I don't know how exactly how it happened, but they reached out to Ace and Peter, to, but they, uh, MTV wanted those guys involved. They wanted Ace and Peter to play on it too, from what I remember correctly. So anyways, it worked, you know, there was a lot of haggling going on between people that represented Ace and Peter, even to the 11th hour, the day of the event, it was getting crazy, but we, we all went to New York. We rehearsed for about a week at SAR studios. And, um, you know, to kind of, you know, fine tune everything and also to get Ace and Peter into the unplugged format and mode because we had been doing this all summer. So we were well versed in it. By this point, we were used to playing acoustic and playing at that level and that dynamic, which is very different than playing electric. So Ace and Peter hadn't been doing this. So they had to kind of come in and kind of figure out, like, what it is like to play Kiss songs on acoustic guitars in this different format. Get them in the swing of so we, things. Yeah, just kind of, well, just kind of, you know, in all fairness to everybody, it was, we've been doing it all summer for six weeks at that point. They hadn't done it at all. So the whole idea was to, hey, this is what we're doing and this is how we've been doing it and, you know, kind of fit them in, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, and so my perspective, when we were doing rehearsals, um, just and you know, I don't say this to be um, negative about anybody, but my opinion, because there was already rumors swirling and all stuff, and I thought, to me, based on the rehearsals and what I'd seen and heard, I said there's no way they could do a reunion. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful, but I'm just telling you, <laughs> I thought there's no way they could do a reunion. And Bruce kept saying, "Oh yeah, they can." And they, and, and um, when they announced that they were going to do a reunion, I was I have to admit I was shocked. I, I didn't I was shocked that they would do it because I didn't think based on what we had just experienced and that that was in August of that year of 95. We went into the studio and started working on Carnival Souls after that. So we were in the middle of uh, doing a record and then in January of 96, the record was done. We were just mixed. We were in the final mixing stages. That's when Gina Paul had a meeting with Bruce and I and said, um, you know, we're doing a... Um, we're going to do a reunion uh, tour with Ace and Peter. We don't know how it's going to go or how long it's going to last, um, but this is what we're doing. And we want, you know, they basically sat us down and told us face to face, like a meeting with just the four of us. So I was obviously not very happy. Of course. I think more of it, one, I was just, you know, look at everybody's going to be disappointed if you lose your gig. But I was surprised because I didn't, based on what I had experienced that previous summer, I was like, really? It just seemed like, I was surprised that they were going to attempt it. Okay. So, um, and, and the funny part is that you were the one who talked to Gene and said, no, it's okay for Peter to come down. And maybe yeah, but, yeah, he... but, but, but I know, but let's be clear that that's not what made the reunion tour happen. Some people like trying to think like, Oh, do you think, do you ever regret that you suggest that? It's like, no, because that was how I felt at the time. And it was genuine. And I thought it would yeah. be a cool experience for everybody, mainly the fans, which it was. Um, in no way, let me tell you, I know Gene and Paul and I know Ace and Peter. I know Gene and Paul very well, obviously, for 25 years. Believe me, uh, they were probably already in discussions and talking about this stuff even as we, as we were doing that. That was, I think, a way to see how things would go um, or at least a way to kind of like break ground, if you will. Okay. And, um, you know, 
I, I don't want to, I don't know if I was being naive or just didn't want to admit that I thought it could happen. I don't know what, but I just know that I didn't think it could happen. Bruce told me that he always thought that they would at some point, even before any of this stuff manifested itself. He always felt that at one point they'll probably put the makeup on and do something with the original band again. He told me he felt that back when Eric Carr was in the band and even said that. Um, so, uh, anyways, you know, I find it interesting because I've heard some people say like that, oh, after Kiss did MTV Unplugged, they had a record in the can and they had to shelve it because they had to go, there was so much demand for a reunion tour. Um, that's not true. We weren't even in the studio yet. We went into the studio after MTV Unplugged, which was in August of 95. We went into the studio after that and started doing the record. We had been doing demos for the previous like year and a half. I mean, on and off, I'd go to with Gene or Bruce to a studio and do demos. Sometimes to Paul's house. He had a little home studio at the time. We were always working on different song ideas and trying to figure out what kind of record or what kind of songs or what direction to do. In fact, at one time, I remember we got together in a rehearsal with, with Bob Ezrin and played some ideas for him. And, and Bob thought that based on the kind of song ideas and the direction that Gene and Paul wanted to go, that he didn't think he was the right producer to do another follow-up record after Revenge. So Ezrin ended up not doing it, and Toby Wright ended up doing the record. Okay. But um, even after Gene and Paul announced that they were doing the reunion tour, um, in January, we, we still were going to the studio and mixing the record. Um, I, you know, we were still going there and working on some final overdubs and mixing of the stuff. So, um, I re Cause I remember Keith LaRue coming in from somewhere. And I remember we played him some, let him hear some of the tracks. And I think, I don't know if, who told him, but I think somebody told him, Oh yeah, these guys are doing a reunion. And we told him, even though we were still there mixing the record, <laughs> and finishing up the mix because the bottom line is they the, the band had to still deliver a final you know the completed record because they were paid for it if a label gives you money for a product you still have to deliver the product so they didn't know what they were going to do with it at the time and it, it kind of it, it did get shelved but it didn't get shelved because of mtv and plugged it got shelved because they did decide to do a reunion tour and announced it but we recorded it after MTV and Plug. It was recorded in the fall of 95, going into January of 96. And they announced, they told us in January of 96 that they were going to do a reunion tour. And uh, basically, um, you know, uh, you know, just for the record, Bruce and I were still um, on a retainer from the band the whole year of 96. Because Gene and Paul didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know if it was going to be successful or not. They didn't know uh, the dynamic between the four original guys, if it was going to work out or not. And because the fear, and I don't want to say the fear of unknown, but because of uncharted, unknown territory going forward, they thought, you know, this thing we might, hey, we might all decide to just do one small tour or one go around and everybody decides that's it or it doesn't work out or whatever the reasons are, and we'll just go, we have a record in the can, we have Eric and Bruce here, ready to go, we'll just go back and continue on what we're doing. So that was an option that was always there on the back burner if they chose to do that. But obviously the tour was a huge success, it blew up, and by that summer, I remember Gene had another meeting with us and said, hey guys, we should, and they basically said, hey, you know, and at this point, now we're talking August of 96, the tour had been a huge success. It was, you know, 96, 97, that was the biggest, or 96, it was definitely the biggest tour in America. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was a huge success. And they just said, you know, we're staying in makeup with the original band, and that's it. So you guys are, you know, basically they were letting us know you guys are free to go do whatever you want. And that was it. And they, But I have to say, respectfully, both times, you know, they said it to our face. They didn't, like, have some lawyer send me a letter or some manager call you up. No, Gene called me up and, and Paul and they said, let's get together. And we sat down face to face, four guys, and they did it the right way. So I always respect them for that. Um, a lot of people never know how this stuff gets dealt with or how you deal with it. And let me tell you, a lot of times, usually it's a manager or some lawyer doing the dirty work. Right. And in this case, um, I will say, you know, they were very straight up about it and said, hey, this is what's going on. And then when it came to the point, like, okay, this is what we're going to continue to do. This is what we're doing. And that was it. 
So it was cool. And wow. that's why, in my opinion, that's why, I mean, I've never, you know, I may have diff- difference of opinion or how I feel about certain things that have gone on in my time in KISS and dealing with certain business aspects of things. But at the, at, when I look at the overall picture, you know, I get along with those guys great. Um, obviously, that's why they asked me back because, you know, I never slammed them and, you know, and uh, got into crap in the press. And I, you know, I've never done that about anybody I worked with in any bands. The bottom line is, it's called, you know, there's an old saying. It's called the music business. It's not called music friends. Even though you aren't friends with each other, it's not called music friends. It's called music business. And I know people hate, they really hate hearing that. But the truth is, it's a business. And it's how we make a living. I make a living playing drums. I happen to play in a band called Kiss. You know, it's a unique thing. It's a great thing. I'm very blessed. But the bottom line is, that's how I make a living. So sometimes when people do things and people get mad and think like, oh, everybody just cares about money. It's only about business. Well, it's not only about money and it's not only about business. But it is a business and it's how I make my money. It's how I make a living. So just like you're respectful of the job you do and how you make a living and how you survive and pay your bills. I think because it's a unique way a person makes a living, people don't, it, it, it gives you a unique perspective or point of view about it. I understand that. People want to look at music as from an, usually a purely a more emotional point of view and yeah. a passionate point of view, but they forget that, but that's how these guys make a living. And I may not like a lot of things they do or how they do things, but I have to respect that that's their job and that's what they choose to do. And yeah. um, it makes a lot of sense. And that, so that being said, do you see, um, so, you know, obviously right now you're in KISS. Do you see Gene and Paul as an employer? Well, I see them as both. I see them as my friends. I see them as my bandmates. And I see them as my bosses. Yeah, all of the above. Because, okay. that's, because that's what they are. I mean, if you want to get technical, yeah, they're my boss. Of course they are. KISS is a company. It's a band, but it's a company. And I work for that company. And they're my bosses. But it's not a typical boss thing. We have a very unique thing. I mean, w- you know, when we do things, Cassius, you know, we do everything the same. I'm telling you. I mean, we have the same hotel rooms. If they have a suite, I have a, I have a suite. Um, we travel on the same plane. If we're flying commercial, we all fly in first class. I mean, I mean, we travel together. We do things as KISS and as a band. Who makes the business decisions for the band? Of course, Gene and Paul. Who makes the main decisions? Those guys. I mean, I know a lot of people hate these cliched um, references, but it really is truly like, you know, you got four people in a car, but somebody's got to drive the car. Mm-hmm. And Usually the, somebody's got to steer the ship. I mean, I know these are cliches. People get into, oh, these are, everybody says the same shit over and over. But you know what I know something? Things become cliches because there's some truth in it. And the, the reality is if, if you go to a job, somebody's the boss. Even if he's the boss of your ship, somebody owns that company. Somebody makes the executive, if you will, decisions about that company. And it's no different for KISS. And okay. Who's going, to, who's going to make the, the, the final decision? Somebody who owns it, but also who's been running it and knows it the best and been there from day one. Gene and Paul created this and been there from day one. Did they create it on their own? No, we know that. But they, they're the one constant that's always been there from day one is those two. And they have always had a point of view and a vision, even if some people don't agree or like certain things that they've done throughout the, their career. Bottom line is, it's their band, and they have a choice and a right to run their company and their band and their business the way they want to, just like every band. You know, the thing is, every band, I've been in many bands and worked with many different artists. Let me tell you, there's a common thread that runs through all of the bands. Which is? They, well, that they all kind of run, they all kind of do things very similar and very much the same. There's always somebody that's in charge. There's always a manager that does, you know, they, all bands play good cop, bad cop. Somebody's the bearer of bad news. It's usually a manager or a lawyer or somebody like that. that and then the artist doesn't like to get involved in those kind of situations because it's awkward for them. So they have somebody else do their, their dirty work, if you will, is what we call it. But we call it good cop, bad cop. Hmm. Somebody is the one that comes in is the bearer of bad news. And it's usually not the, the artist. It's usually somebody that works for the artist. 
Wow. Um, it's just it's just the dynamic of how it works, and I know a lot of people don't like it. Some people, when they re- you know, it's like Alice in Wonderland. I'm sorry, it's like the Wizard of Oz. When you open the curtain, realize, oh, there is no wizard. There's a guy behind the curtain. <laughs> Well, that's kind of the way the music business is in a lot of ways. If you want to just keep it a fantasy and enjoy it from a distance like that, then don't ask all those questions and don't don't dig into the rabbit hole to find out all this minutia and dig up all the dirt on it because you're going to find out. Just like in your own family, there's an uncle that did something that's frowned upon or, you know, you, you know there's uh, – Somebody that has a, a police record or whatever it is. Every family has skeletons in the closet. Mm-hmm. Well, every band's the same way. I mean, there's a lot of parallels just in all things in life. All you know, I always say this, Cassius, when it comes to bands, same movie, different actors. So basically, it's the same movie in every band. It's just you just change the names or change the little scenarios slightly, but it's basically the same kind of stuff goes on in every band that I've ever worked with or worked for. And then when I hear stories of other bands, whether it's Aerosmith, Motley Crue, et cetera, et cetera, same stuff. There's always the same kind of stories. There's a lot of parallel. It's just the way, it's the way people are. It's the way humans are. Yeah, it is. So wait, you're telling me that you're not sitting there in your kiss costume and makeup right now. Is that what you're trying to say? Nope, not yet. Wow. It's a little early in the day. It's a little early in the day, but I, I will be soon. But I am sitting next to my new cats. I got two, I got two new cats last week. Oh, yeah? What are their names? Their names are Ash is the boy. He's all black. I mean, and he's all black. He's like, he's, I mean, I have to be careful because at nighttime I can't see him. He, like, <laughs> runs around between your legs and stuff. He's, like, really hard to see. Um, and the female's name is Scarfy, like a scarf you wear on your neck. Mm-hmm. I don't know why she named her Scarfy. I have no idea. I never asked her yet. She just told me that's the name. So it's it's Ash and Scarfy. And um, they're, I don't know how old they are. I think they're about... I don't know, maybe 11 or 12 weeks old or something like that now. Wow. So so you just got two but, free cats. Yeah, I just got them a week and a half ago. So, um, I, yeah, it's, well, I love cats. I've always, you know, and it's no, it's not because I wear cat man makeup. <laughs> I've, always, I've always loved cats. I mean, we've, our family, um, growing up, we always had every kind of animal you could think of, like snakes, frogs, turtles, rabbits, you know, dogs, cats, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um I mean, at, at one time I had two dogs and two cats, and then eventually they all kind of got old and passed away. And I was down to no animals for a few months, and it was the first time I had no no pet in like twenty something years. And I kind of wanted to take a break, but then, like I said, uh, you know, uh, as fate would have it, my neighbor happened to I, you know, conveniently have a litter. So <laughs> I guess I was meant to, I guess I was meant to have new cats, but I'm glad I got them because they're really cool. And, uh, they, you know, they, they, I love, I like cats cause I, I like the, um, I like in my personality and, and I'm not saying I'm a cat, but I'm, I'm more independent kind of person and I'm more self-sufficient. In other words, I take care of myself. I don't need a lot of maintenance of people doing things for me. Yeah. And cats are like, cats are like that. You know, they're very independent dogs. You have to give a lot of attention to, you know, you can't just like, you can leave your house for a couple of days and put a bunch of food and water out and a litter box and the cats will be fine. You can't do that with a dog. So, yeah. They're independent. So I like that. Yeah, I, I, that's what it is. I like, in fact, I, I I like people in general that are, I like that characteristic in people. I like people that are very independent. They're self-sufficient, do things on their own. So I think that's why I probably like cats a little, a little more than dogs, although I like them both probably equally, but I probably prefer to have cats, I should say. But that's mainly because of my lifestyle, traveling so much. It's, a, it's too hard to take care of dogs. Um, yeah, it makes sense. When, you're, when you travel so much. So I have about one more question for you. I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, you know, thanks for sharing your time with me. This stuff that you've been sharing is, uh, it's really interesting. And, you know, as a longtime KISS fan, a lot of it I really had no idea about, you know, how it works behind the scenes. You know, it's, it's really interesting. So thank you. Oh, that's no problem. I mean, now, I, didn't you say you were going to put out some questions? Did you have questions from people? Yeah, I was actually just going to ask one of them. Well, you can ask for, well, you can ask a few of them because bottom line is, I know it's your show, but the whole idea people are using you as a vehicle to get some answers um, for the questions that they might not be able to ask that person. So they're kind of looking to you for that. So, I mean, I don't mind asking a few questions. And, uh, you know, as, as most people will tell you, I'm pretty – pretty straight up forthcoming about stuff. If I don't want to answer something, I'll just say, Hey, I don't want to answer it or no comment. Uh, 
um, rather than rather than duck the issue, I'll just be straight up and say, I, you know, either it's none of your business or whatever. Okay, so so we'll try this. I I won't give you know stupid questions like how do you feel about wearing and and it's not that it's stupid. I just won't give questions that have been answered already. Like how do you feel about the Catman makeup? We all know that already. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, to me, you know, just 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 to touch on that again, it's um, it's always been a non-issue for me emotionally or otherwise. And I I you know I I don't mean that disrespectfully to anybody. That it is important to them. That's fine. That's cool. Um, the only thing I don't understand, um, I shouldn't say don't understand what I don't get is like for those either fans or former fans that continually complain, not just about that issue, but anything to do with kiss and continue to say how they're done with the band and I'm over it and I hate it. And I'm going to, but yeah, they continually talk about it nonstop. It's like, <laughs> I just don't under, I don't, maybe you can enlighten me. I just don't understand that that point of view or that thought process because me, myself, when I'm done with something like whether it's a former friend, ex-girlfriend, anything, a band, some, or a product. If I don't like the way a product, if they change the way the product tastes or the way it looks, if I don't like it anymore, guess what? I go, oh, okay. I don't really care for it anymore. I stop buying it. I stop supporting it or I don't listen to it. I don't eat it. Whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I just, I move on from it and I go, okay, I move on. I don't like it anymore. Um, it's like having your favorite restaurant and all of a sudden they change the menu or they change the cook and you go, Hey, the food doesn't taste the same anymore. I'm not really digging it. And you just stop. guess, what do you do? You don't, instead of keep going there and going, Hey, you know, I don't like that you change the cook. And I think you need to get that old cook back and you need to do that. I don't do that. I just go, all right, something's not right. Or I don't care for it anymore. <laughs> and I don't go and I don't buy it and I don't support it. It's just simple. Now, yeah. maybe I'm looking at it too black and white, but for me, I just don't, really fully understand fans or former fans that have that point of view. I get the passion part. I get that, you know, something like a band kiss means a lot to them or it had a real impact on their life. I get it, but it had a real impact on me too. Cause guess what? I play in the band, you know? Yeah. So of course it means, of course I care. It means something to me, but I don't understand the people that, that um, can't just move on and and move on and go do if, if you don't like it mm-hmm. or have a problem with something, just, you know, I mean, respectfully, just move on and great, you know, for, for those that like it or want to enjoy it, cool. Well, uh, I'm not saying that you should just blindly go, oh, I agree with anything the band does and I don't care. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if you really, really have a distaste for it, um, don't be, you know, if you're going to be mad just because the band's not doing what you want, then go, okay, I'm not into it anymore. That's, I mean, Cassius, that's what I did my whole life when it came to bands. If a band kind of changed musical sound or direction and I kind of lost interest in them, I stopped buying the records and I didn't go to the concerts. And, you know, like I said, I didn't hate them. I just said, okay, well, I'm not really into it anymore. It's over. Well, yeah, listen, what I can tell you about that, you know, like you said, if I could enlighten you or something, shed some light, you know, as a fan. I'll tell you that these people who do this, I think that it's because they've had such a huge emotional connection to kiss their entire lives. And to them, Peter, Chris, they don't, some of those people don't seem to differentiate that Peter, Chris is not the cat man. Peter, Chris is not the makeup. Peter, Chris is a drummer that was in kiss and growing up, having those figures being such huge parts of their childhood for some reason, they feel like you wearing the makeup is a slap in the face or a disrespect. I just don't get it. And I, I, I will tell you, though, like having been on the message boards for years and having just left, most of the fans ask the same question as you. Why are you still here? And those fans who are always complaining, they ruin it for the fans that enjoy it. And that's part of the reason why I don't use those boards, because it's just some of those people really, they can't let it go. Yeah, well, like I said, it's uh, it's not going to change um it's not going to change just because they don't like it. Um, what I find really interesting, though, is that some people will continually complain about everything and anything KISS does, and they don't even participate in this stuff. In other words, they don't go to the shows, or they don't go to the KISS cruise, or they didn't go to Las Vegas, or they don't do any of these things, but yet they're continually complaining about everything and every aspect of almost following it play-by-play. Mm-hmm. Playing armchair, playing armchair quarterback and complain. I'm like, 
that to me is very odd. I don't understand that. It's like, like I said earlier, if I don't like something, I don't even follow it. I just don't pay attention to it anymore. I'm like, I move on. And to com- keep complaining about everything, and, and I'm like, wow, you don't even go to the shows, you don't even go on the Kiss cruise, and yet you're complaining and how Kiss is, you know, either screwing over the fans or what a rip off this or that is. I'm thinking like, well, you're not even going. Why do you care? Why yeah. is it? Why is it? Why do you care? Or why do you, even if you think it's wrong or whatever you think, why do you care if you're not like in other words, you didn't pay any money, you're not participating. So that to me is very um, that mindset is very baffling to me. It's, it's bizarre. It's very bizarre. I find it like you know, like I said. Look, I understand everybody can have their own opinion, and that's great. I, I respect everybody's opinion, even if I think it's ridiculous or don't agree with it. I, I, I can respect that that's, if that's how they feel. You can't tell people how to feel. People make a choice how to feel. And mm-hmm. that's what I'm getting to. They're making this conscious choice to feel this way instead of going, okay, I'm not going to be emotionally invested in this stuff anymore. And at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people get very mad when I say this, but it's just a band. It really is. It We're is. a band that plays music, that puts on makeup. And it, you know, and it's, it's all about having a good time and having fun. We do, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean... Hey, bottom line is, do you think Gene and Paul would keep playing, doing Kiss, if they didn't have to? I mean, I mean, just because they feel like they have to, they need the money. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to do anything. They don't need to do this. They don't need the money. They don't need to do it. I'm going to tell you, I can tell you this. Aside from all the business stuff, the merchandise, and all these things related to Kiss, I can tell you this. Those guys love being on stage. They love performing. They like being in Kiss. Let me tell you, nobody's a bigger Kiss fan than Gene Simmons. Yeah. He's the, who, who's the, you know, people always might ask you, who's the biggest Kiss fan you've ever met? I'm sure you've discussed this with your friends or ask other Kiss fans, who's the biggest Kiss fan? Or that guy's the biggest Kiss fan I ever met. No, the biggest Kiss fan you'll ever meet is Gene. No <laughs> doubt about it. I'm telling you, look, he really, that's his life. He loves Kiss. He. Really, I think he really realizes every day, I'm living a dream. I came here from like a poor country where I had nothing, came to America, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But you want to know something? He, he, I, can, I know him. I sit next to him every day putting on makeup for a couple of hours. I ride with him in the vehicle to and from hotels, to and from the gigs, all over. I'm around Gene a lot when we're on tour. Mm-hmm. I can tell you this. He is a very focused, driven, passionate guy about kiss he loves it let me tell you these guys do care they care about the show that kiss does let me tell you if gene finds out on a certain night oh we can't, you can't fly or you can't uh uh you can't read fire because of the fire marshal code or something you know, we have limited production we, the spider's not going to move because they can't uh the, the roof won't support the motors in this particular venue or it's too low of a ceiling i mean there's always a lot of different issues that you have to take into consideration when you plan a tour and then some people go, well, why don't they book these venues? And the yeah. bottom line is, is a pro- your agent goes out and says, Kiss is going to go on tour. Here's their production requirements. They send it out. Promoters in the big, different areas say, oh, I want to buy the show, meaning I want to have Kiss come to my city and play my venue. All right, what venue are you going to play? Well, I'm doing, I bought all my shows to do. I'm going to do 10 shows in the summer at a summer outdoor shed, meaning Kiss and nine other bands. And we might say, oh, that place sucks. I don't want to play that place. Well, that's the offer you got. And that works with, and it works with your routing. Don't forget, you can't just zigzag back and forth all over the country. You have to kind of have it make geographical sense. Like we're going from Cleveland to Pittsburgh or Cleveland to Cincinnati or Cleveland to Indianapolis. You know, you can't have these drives be thousand miles every single night where you're zigzagging back and forth. It has to make sense. Yeah. Because you're moving 15 or 16 semi trucks of equipment that you have to tear down and then set up every time you do a concert, pack it up. It takes X amount of hours to drive that equipment across a certain distance, X amount of fuel costs. I mean, there's all these costs associated with being on tour. If people knew how much money that KISS spends per week to be on tour, when they want to talk about KISS, like not, you know, uh, giving the money back to the fans yeah. and giving them show and all that. Let me tell you, the number that it costs per week to stay on tour with Kiss and tour 
it's pretty astronomical. People would be blown away if they knew how much money Kiss spends production-wise every week. For that means for trucking, fuel, salaries, you know, airfares, commissions, all that stuff. I mean, lawyers, accountants. I mean, there's a lot of people that got to get paid. And just so you know, Kiss pays everybody very well. You know, okay. people always have this misnomer that somehow uh, Gina Paul are cheap and all this stuff. I can tell you this. Everybody that works on that tour gets paid very well. They get paid above the industry average. That I know. It's a dream job. Let me tell you. They get paid above. The, do they work hard? Hell yeah. <laughs> they work their asses off on some days. Those guys have busting their asses. They're working long days, long hours, setting up and tearing down stuff. Those, you know, we have some great guys on our crew. They're cool people. They do a great job, and they work hard. But they also get paid very well for that job that they do. And a lot of people always somehow, there's always been this wrong information where people somehow think like, oh, Jane and Paul are cheap. And, you know, let me tell you, I'm not saying this to defend anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you because it's the truth. I know what these guys get paid, and I know what other people on similar tours are getting paid. Believe me, our guys get paid very well, very, very well, and they get treated good. Um, so, you know, it's unless you really do this and work in the business and have an understanding of the mechanics and inner workings of stuff, then you're going to have a different point of view and a different appreciation. A lot of people think they really know a lot of stuff about the business. They really do. It's amazing to hear their comments and stuff. And you're like, and they, you know, you'll get one that tries to think they know no more than the other or they're Mr. Know-it-all and they think they really know. But it's like, unless you work in the business, I mean, you worked out on tour, been in a band, made records, and really have a full appreciation and understanding of how it all works, then it gives you a different perspective on things. Totally mm -hmm. different perspective. If I didn't, I mean, Cassius, if I didn't do what I do and didn't have the experience that I have, I, I'm guarantee. In fact, I know I would have a different perspective. I mean, a different point of view about everything. Of totally. Course. But now I know how it works. I'm like, oh, okay. That's why I really laugh at a lot of these people, journalists and other people that make comments about stuff. I'm thinking like, wow, you want people to think that you really know what you're talking about, but you really don't. And, and, less, and, and, and in all fairness, I mean, everybody has an opinion. So because somebody does a blog or has a website or whatever they have, that doesn't mean that your opinion is also automatically more valid or you're smarter. Yeah. Um, it, it means that you have a format and a vehicle to espouse your point of view and your opinions. That's all it means. But it doesn't mean it's necessarily more valid. Um, and, and in some cases, some people are a little more experienced. But I find the people that actually know what it is like to play in a band, to play an instrument, to make records, really have done different facets of the music business. And as a musician, mind you, I'm saying, not just work for a label or something, but I mean be a musician. That's a different point of view. As opposed to working for a band or with a band, being in a band is a really different point of view. That's all I'm saying. And a lot of these guys, they don't know that. They think they do. But they don't know that. You don't know until you do it. It's like somebody saying, how does it feel to drive with 200 miles an hour in a car? Well, you're never going to know until you actually do it. So yeah, it's, I think being hands-on gives you that unique perspective and point of view that is just, I don't want to say automatically more legit, but it makes you see things differently and have, a, a, I think, a, a better understanding that's more reality based. Yeah, you that's see things for what they really are. Yeah, more reality based because at the end of the day, you could still walk away with having a point of view or opinion that's going to be different than somebody else, and that's okay. But at least I'll respect it. I personally will respect it more if I know that person really knows what they're talking about, has done it, and knows what they're talking about. A guy that's toured and made records, I'm going to take his point of view a little differently than a guy that's just buys a record and goes to a concert. Yeah, and, and that's definitely fair. That makes, you know, perfect sense from my end. So let's get into some of the fan questions that so that maybe you could uh, enlighten them on some of their questions. Um, so the first one I took down, and like I said, you know, you said it, I'll say it. If there's anything you don't want to touch on, just let me know and we'll just move on. Um, no problem. 
Elliot Robert Bayliss wants to know, was there any truth behind Kisteria, and do you think similar stunts pulled by Gene and Paul detract from the band's music? Was there any what in Kisteria? Any truth behind the, like, the story in the, in the film there? Well, you know when they call it reality? Paul Stanley, I think, said it best. I'll quote him. He said, how can somebody be really, truly reality TV when you know there's a camera following you around <laughs> all the time? Yeah. You know, the only real reality TV I've always thought was cops because you had police cameras just rolling and then you're like, okay, that's happening in real time, the situation. That or candid camera. That's reality TV. Everything else, no. It's all, even if it's loosely scripted or totally scripted or kind of, you know, bottom line is if you know cameras on you, you you're going to act differently than if you didn't know. It's just yeah. the way it is. It's like us talking right now. If you knew that this wasn't being recorded, it would be a tiny bit different, but it'd be, it's just that little edge that makes it different. Yeah, like, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So, that, okay, fair enough. But do you think that it, it removes from the band's music at all or overshadows? Look, Kiss is a different kind of a band in that regard, but a lot of bands have done that stuff. Ozzy, and a lot of people don't like it, but you want to know something? Ozzy doing the Osbournes raised Ozzy's profile as where he became a celebrity and a musician or, you know, or celebrity and recording us. He became both. And, the, and in this day and age of celebrity, the last say 10 years, it works for a lot of people. I and mean, we have people that are famous or infamous, however you want to look at it for doing nothing that have no talent. And I don't mean that to be mean, mm -hmm. but what is, what are the people on Jersey shore famous for <laughs> being themselves? I guess. I don't know. No, but what I mean is like, in other words, what's their talent? Yeah, um, it's nothing. They don't, they're not athletes. They're not entertainers and musicians or nothing. Um, I, you know, I remember going to a Laker game years ago, and a lot of times if there's certain people, celebrities in the audience, sometimes over the PA, they'll announce like so-and-so, you know, and they'll put them on the screen. And I remember one time they, they go, um, you know, sitting in the court side, they go, here's uh, from the TV show or whatever. It was like, Jay Wow. And she stands up and she's waving. I thought, like, <laughs> and I remember thinking in that moment right there, not that I get served personally because I don't even know the girl. I don't even care. Um, I'm thinking, like, hey, power to you. If you can get attention, if that's what you want, you want some kind of celebrity or recognition or attention, cool. I don't have a problem with that. But I thought, like, wow, this is a weird commentary on, on the world, or at least in America right now. This girl... They're recognizing her, pointing her out as a celebrity, and I'm thinking like, what is she famous for? She's not like it's not like when it's not like if Gene's sitting courtside and you say, Gene Simmons of Kiss, okay, I get it. There's yeah. a guy from a big big rock band. Or or uh, Magic Johnson, you know, or he'll be on court or David Beckham, he'd always be at a lot of the games. You know, and they yeah. you know, that kind of thing. They show him on the screen. Will Farrell, you know, athletes and entertainers and actors. I get that. But when I see somebody like famous for what? I mean, that's that to me. That's something I've never quite understood. People, America especially, the fascination with just creating these—I call them faux celebrities—creating these fake celebrities that are famous for doing nothing. It's like, yeah, it's really okay. weird. And it's like it's different with Ozzy and Gene because they were already super famous from having actual real yeah, raw I mean, talent. I, look, I, look, I don't, I don't. I'm not putting people down for it. Like, you know, hey, if you get on a reality show and you end up turn it into a business or something, cool. I don't have a problem. It doesn't matter to me. It's like, like I told you earlier, I, if I don't like something, I just change the channel or I don't follow it. And I don't follow any of those people. So I don't watch Jersey Shore and I never did. I mean, I, I remember when the show first came on, Gene called me up one time. He goes, hey, Eric, if you ever, there's this new show where these guys are talking like, you know, these, you know, the guys from New York, they, Hey, how you doing? Hey, hey, Joe, hey, Rocky, and you all know, that. Cause you know, guys talk like that. And I'm like, he goes, yeah, there's this show where these guys talk like that. All these Goomba guys from New York, and you know, he did at that time. I don't think he realized it was New Jersey, but he's, he, he told me about the show. He told me to watch, told me to put it on. So I put it on and I was like, wow. I hadn't, I didn't know the show existed at the time. Gene's the one that told me to watch it because he said he couldn't believe that there was his show following all these, you know, guys and girls from New Jersey that talked that way. Like, hey, are you talking to me and all that stuff? <laughs> he goes, yeah, that's all they do. I like, and that's all they do in the show. They don't really do anything. It's just following them around and them in their daily lives. And that turned into this phenomenon. 
in America. But America's obsessed with any kind of crazy celebrity. And, and let's face it, people like train wrecks. So the yeah. more drama and problems, people love it. Yeah, there's a lot of fights on that show, especially. You know, I watched it for a little bit. I was a lot younger. I was like 10, and I thought it was – It's I'd never – you know, I'd never been to the States. I never knew what that was like. So even if it may not be an accurate descript- depiction, I thought it was interesting. Um, but, you know, oh, that's interesting. Right. I, I, I just, like I said, power to everybody. But going back to your original question, um, look, at every band does stuff, Cassius, that you can in the moment think, oh, it's cool to do this. Or your manager convinces you that you should do this, that this is good. Or this is good business. Or this is good for you for profile. Or this is good... Or this is a good connection because it might lead to us doing something else. I mean, you're always trying to find ways to keep the machinery oiled and moving forward. And let's face it, everybody can always look back. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Everybody can always look back and go, oh, I can't believe the way I dressed that. Oh, I look like an idiot. <laughs> oh, I wish we didn't do that. That was embarrassing. Of course, everybody has those moments. And, you know, um, but you do what you think is the right thing to do, or you try to make the best record you can in a given moment. And in that moment, you think you're doing the right thing, or you think it's the best thing you're doing. And it is in that moment. Only way you tell is later on when you look back and reflect on it and go, that was not cool, or that was a mistake, or wish we could have that moment back, or wish I didn't look like that. Okay, but you have to sometimes do those things to recognize that. That's all. Okay. Well, well, good answer. I'm glad you answered that. And people were wondering, so that's, that's uh there you go. You got your, your answer, Elliot. So the next one is from Rob Strachan. I hope I'm saying that right. He says, could you see yourself and Tommy carrying on in kiss when Gene and Paul retire? Um, you know, everybody has their, has broached that subject, meaning like fans and you know, they, I'm sure you guys have heard comments through the years, past few years, yeah. By people saying, oh I, oh, I could see a kiss without Gene and Paul or Cicero. Um, You know, me personally, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I doubt it will be with me. So why would they replace you if you're still willing to go? No, what I'm saying is I doubt that – what I mean is I don't think I would want to do that. That's what I'm saying. Okay, I got gotcha. you. I mean, like, to me, Gene and Paul have always been the main cogs – in the machinery, if you will, of KISS. And I mean that no disrespect to Ace or Peter, who, you know, started the original band with those four, um, and anyone that's been in the band. Because everybody has come in, I always thought, and helped, you know, they brought something to the band, maybe in different increments or different value, depending on how a fan or a particular fan may want to see a particular era. Because you got to remember, Cash, some people, their version of KISS is Crazy Nights, or their version of KISS is, you know, 1980 with Eric Carr with Ace and Gina Paul, you know, yeah. in Australia, or it's, or it's Revenge, or it's Now. I mean, you know, I've, I've been around this band for 25 years. I've seen fans of all eras and all incarnations of the band. But for me, the one constant has always been Gina Paul. They've always been the principal songwriters and the main vocalist. That's just the way it's always been. Every yeah. record, they, they've done a majority of that. Um, and there's a reason for that. And it's not to take away from the talents and abilities of other people or, you know, cause some people want to think like, Oh, those other guys were kept down or whatever. Look at, you can't just put songs on records because somebody goes, well, I wrote a song and I have to have a song on it too. You got to put what works for the record works for the band. And if somebody's more the main guy in the band or the main songwriter, that's the way it is. In some bands, you know, people contribute their, their personality and their parts to the songs, but somebody is the main creative or driving force behind it. And it's just the way it is. This dynamic goes on in a lot of bands. Um, it's in fact, it's pretty much almost every band. Yeah, from absolutely. What from, what I've, from what I've experienced. And I think, um, I don't know what the future is going to hold for Kiss when Gene or Paul or both of them decide that they don't want to do it anymore. If they're going to try to create a whole new Kiss and put together some kind of a show that's, uh, you know, it's, Kiss themed and it's called Kiss, but it's really nobody that's ever been in the band before. So I don't know. I mean, I, I guess you know the canvas is clear and wide open for what the future may hold. Mm-hmm. And I always say, when it comes to Kiss, never say never about anything because I've been proven wrong myself when I thought they would never do certain things, and then they did. So now I always keep that in the back of my mind. Anything is possible. And uh, I mean, me personally, if Gene and Paul aren't in Kiss. I don't think I have much interest in being in Kiss if they're not in Kiss. 
And and honestly, I wouldn't have interest in watching it. I mean, if if you or Tommy were in it, I would watch it. But if it's four new guys, I mean, uh, that's well, what, just I'm, not... what I'm saying. What I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if Paul Stanley decides, like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore, um, let's just get somebody to replace Paul. Um, that doesn't sound. Uh, that doesn't sound inviting to me. No. Um, same thing as if Gene left. I mean, if it was going to be just Paul, Tommy, and I with a different guy. It doesn't sound inviting to me. It just doesn't. Um, and I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't know if that could be possible. There's po- some people that think it could, and there's obviously people that think it couldn't. But for me, would I want to be a part of that? I'd probably, I'd probably lean more towards no. At this, okay. at, at, at this point, it's just not something. It's not something that interest that's interesting to me. Um, you know, maybe it's because I've been around them so long and I realize the importance of what they do. I mean, they are the, the pillars of KISS, if you will. They are. Absolutely. Well, and again, another great answer. Um, this one is from Josh York. He wants to know, if it was in your control, are there two or three songs that you would add to the set list? Well, I go through this every time. We go to do... Uh, something and then i know put it this way how a lot of the fans on chat boards and have discussions about different songs they'd like to hear or obscure stuff i'm that guy in the band so <laughs> um oh i am i'm that guy paul sometimes just laughs at me when i'm saying a song he uh, when i suggest a song or something he kind of like and he's not dismissive with me about it i can tell but he knows that i'm a fan of the early days and um that i like like i love those first three records so to me, I always want to play anything off the first three records because those, just like you, Cassius, you have a certain record or era that influenced or impacted you in some way. And that's the stuff that you really somehow identify with. I'm the same way. I identify with certain songs and era of Kiss. And so to me, anytime I can play anything off of Kiss, Dress to Kill, or Hotter Than Hell, especially Hotter Than Hell or Dress to Kill, I'm uh, I'm down with that, but okay. I have to. Hey, hey, let me tell you the reason we ended up playing the oath was you know a lot to do with me and Tom. To be quite honest, we kept saying we need to do this song. And they're like, no, oh, no, no. I'm like, no, we got to do it. And even again to play it again this year, I said let's play the song again. I go, I know we played it last year. I go, but look at the reaction we got, and the fans loved it. Let's just do it. And then sometimes eventually Paul will go, you know, or Gene will go, okay. And, and and then we do it. And when we play it, then they realize, oh, yeah, it is cool. It's fun. It's just that, you know, we got to remember, Cassius, I wasn't there when they made that record. I, you know, remember a minute ago I mentioned about sometimes you do something and you think you're doing the right thing and you think it's great in the moment. But then you look back and you go, wow, that stunk or that was a mistake. Mm-hmm. And just like I think that there's a little of that going on probably with Gene and Paul regarding the elder, because they did the record. Um, Everybody knows it's well documented at the time that, you know, Ace was against them doing that and said, we shouldn't be doing this. And Bob Ezrin and Gene and Paul said, no, no, we should do this. this," And they all insisted on doing it. And then it, um, you know, they didn't even tour for the record. (laughs) It bombed so bad. It bombed so bad. They didn't even tour for the record. So you can imagine so Gene and Paul, they look back at that time and go, uh, that was not probably a good moment in history. And probably, you know, we know that in hindsight, it wasn't really, you know, we did what we did at the time because we thought it was right, but it really wasn't maybe the greatest idea. And history proves that because they couldn't even tour for it. And the bottom line is, is uh, maybe there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on when they think about playing stuff related to that record. I don't know. I'm speaking, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to think and analyze from my perspective of what I think is maybe has to do with why they're not that fond of that stuff. And I think that they just don't personally think it's very great, very good songs, or they don't think it's very good stuff. Yeah. They just don't like it. I mean, you know? it, it makes sense. They were young, you know, and when you're you're young and you got all this success and fame that goes to your head, not every single thing is going to be your best product. And looking back at that in your 60s, it would make sense to be like, I just want to bury it and forget about it. Well, exactly. You just said it even better than I did. Being 60-something years old 
And looking back on that stuff, you might go, yeah. It's like I told you, I, I see pictures of the way I dressed in certain bands, you know, wearing stupid tights and stuff in the 80s, like a lot of people did. I go, I look like an idiot. And, uh, you know, sometimes, and I, and I swear to God, I go, what was I thinking? Why, why did I do that? But, you know, I guess at the time, I probably thought it was cool or the right thing to do. And that's it. But I cringe when I look at certain things now. So I think the same, I think you got a little of that going on there, Cassius, with certain eras of the band or certain songs and whatever. But um, if, you, if you had, if I had to name a particular song, I know we did Getaway once before, but um, I always liked that song was cool. Um, you know, I like, I like a lot of the songs. I like a lot of the songs that Peter sang only because, um, you know, I like to sing once in a while. And if I'm going to sing any Kiss songs, the only songs that suit my voice is ironically songs that Peter sang. I don't have a voice like Gene or a voice like Paul or a voice like, like Ace did. I don't yeah. have their kind of voice. So it wouldn't make sense for me to necessarily sing songs like that. Although when we did do nothing to lose, I always sang more of the Gene part. Um, That's true. But, but generally my voice is just closer and I'm not saying I sing like Peter. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's closer to that style, you know, and it just, those, that's, those kind of songs just suit me better. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd agree. I, I think it sounds great, you know, when you're doing them. So Getaway is, is on your on the top of your list. I guess. I like Rock Bottom, although we have done it in the past, but I love Rock Bottom. Yeah, it's a great song. I, I, I love the intro. I love the way Paul sings on it. I like the way Paul sings on those kind of songs. Um, he had a certain kind of approach to some of that material then that he uh, that was different. Um, he almost sounded a little bit kind of like, a, for lack of a better word, Paul almost sounded like a like a preacher, you know, the way he would talk to the crowd. He was like a revivalist preacher, you know, like yeah. a Baptist minister. He's kind of like a rock and roll Baptist minister. That's what Paul <laughs> Stanley reminded me of when I Listen, was a kid. Listen, people. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I know where he got it. He got it from, you know, he got it from Steve Marriott from Humble Pie. If you put on Humble Pie, Rock in the Fillmore, just listen to that record and listen to all the between song banter that Steve Marriott talks to, how he talks to the audience. And he's like a same thing. It's like a revivalist preacher. Paul was very influenced by that record and by Steve Marriott and by Humble Pie because of that style. But Paul found a way, which is the cool, the right way to do it. He found a way to take that and he made it his own. So now when you hear it, you don't think, unless you're old enough to know, you don't think like, oh, well, that's Steve Marriott. No, you think that's Paul Stanley. And mm -hmm. because Paul really did make it his own, all the raps became his raps. He, he doesn't do the same raps as Steve Marriott. He just takes the approach and then does a Paul Stanley version of that, which is really, really cool. And that's what makes Paul, one to me, one of the greatest front men ever. I mean, I'll always say that. And I would say this even if I was never in the band or never even knew the guy. Paul Stanley's one of the greatest rock front men ever. And yeah. uh, no doubt about it. I mean, and the great thing is the longevity that Paul's had to this day, Paul's still a great front man. I mean, a lot of the other guys of those generations have come and gone. And there's guys that kind of like for a moment kind of took, you know, kind of took the torch and ran with it for a while, but somehow they always, it, 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 uh, they didn't hold on to it for long, if you will. And, you know, I look at Paul's overall body of work and longevity. Um, he kind of reminds me, I'll, I'll use a parallel. It's kind of like Kobe Bryant now for the Lakers. Kobe mm -hmm. Bryant's been playing like in his 19th year, I mean, I watch him play because I'm a major basketball fanatic. And, I mean, for the amount of miles and years that, and wear and tear and injuries he has on his body, the fact that Kobe Bryant has had such, performs at such a high level, to me, is very, very remarkable and commendable. you got to recognize that. I know he's a polarizing guy when it comes to basketball fans and sports figures, but, man, the, you, got, you can't not give credit where credit is due. And I feel the exact same way about Paul. He's like that. He's one of these guys that's just been around for so long and done things at such a high level. I mean, he takes care of himself. Look what in great shape the guy's in. This guy takes it serious. He, you think he doesn't care about performing or doesn't care? Of course he does. He wouldn't take care of himself and do what he does and be still out there doing it if he didn't. That's what, yeah. I, that's what I, I admire about Gene and Paul is the perseverance, longevity. These guys have rode the roller coaster of Kiss their whole lives. And you know, on a roller coaster, I use that as the analogy because you're always going up and down and up and down through the turns. Sometimes you're chugging up the hill and it's laboring. Other times you're 
put your hands up and scream, and then it goes down, and you get to enjoy the ride. To me, being in Kiss has been like a nonstop roller coaster ride for them. I can and imagine. It, it's a great analogy to use because it really has. And I've been there for a lot. I mean, I've been there for, you know, a good portion of a lot of these um, – stages along the way, if you will, of Kiss's career. I mean, a lot of people may not know this, but now, it's, it's hard to believe, other than Gene and Paul, I've been in Kiss the longest of any other member, other than Gene and Paul. That's true. And, yeah, for, even if you, I'm talking about my time actually active in the band, because obviously I've yeah. been around them since I met Paul in 1989, you know, and uh, and a solo tour, so that was almost 26 years ago. Um, but I've actually started working with Kiss. Well, I even did demos back then with him in '89. But I've actually, um, actually been involved with being in Kiss or not since the end of 2000. I'm sorry, the end of 1991. That's um, a long time. So, yeah. But my active time is the longest running o- over anybody, um, which is kind of pretty crazy. It's a little probably a, 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 a trivia question, if you will, because most people would never even <laughs> know that or think that. Kiss trivia, yeah. Well, it's true. And, and it, you know, just for a second, what you were talking about, about Paul, it's so true. And people sit there, maybe it's one of the things that they complain about, that Paul, obviously he doesn't sound the same as he did. And I don't know how people can expect him to. He still sounds awesome, first of all, in my opinion. But, you know, you can't expect somebody to sound the way they did when they were 26. I don't play the same that I did when I was 26. I'm 56. So, you know something? But I still take, I take care of myself. I I. I, t- I treat what I do seriously. Um, I have respect for it. So because of that, means I have respect for myself and for what I do. Um, I can only speak for myself. I don't make these comments because I'm trying to make a hidden, like, dig at anybody else. No. You know, how everyone chooses to live their life the way they want to live it. But you have to face the consequences of the way you live. So if you don't take care of yourself, then you can't complain to anybody that, your health and skills diminish. It's your fault. Yeah. And, uh, you know, don't blame other people because somebody didn't give a fuck. You know, mm-hmm. that's their own fault. You have to care. It all starts with yourself on things. You have to have enough self pride to care about what you do, no matter what you do, not just being in a band. I'm saying in general. I mean, Gene said this to me once a long time. He goes, you know, because Eric, one thing I don't like is when, you know, you get some guy that's, complaining about his job, like, for example, driving a cab. And they'll say, yeah, well, I'm not really a cab driver. I play in a band. I'm just doing it to pay my bill. And Gene's, Gene's point of view is, okay, but right now you're driving a cab. So that's how you're making a living. You need to be the best cab driver you can be and have your own self inner pride to give a shit about what you do, no matter what it is. If it's, if, even if you're looking, and Paul drove cabs when they were younger. I don't know whether they cared about it, but the bottom line is, it's, it's really this. Even if you're not doing what you want to do or would like to be doing, at least care enough about your own pride. Go, But I have the pride of being of Eric to go, but I'm going to do the best job I can because that reflects on who I am and, and me. And yeah. that's Gene's point. And he told me that very many, I mean, many, many years ago, and I always took that to heart that he's right. You have to care about what you do, no matter what it is. It's even true. if it's not what you, even if it's not what you'd like to be doing or what you say, I mean, I remember I had a drum tech years ago that used to complain because you know, and he really wasn't a drum tech per se, but he was doing drums on that particular tour, and he'd always say, "Well, I'm not really a drum tech." I'm like, "Yeah, but you are now. You're here today, and you're on tour being a drum tech now. You can't say the reason I'm not, I don't do a good job, or the reason I'm not really paying attention to what you know uh, to detail and stuff is because." Uh, that's not really what I do. It's not an excuse. It's not valid. Exactly. It's, it's, it may not be what your expertise in or what your desire is to be, but it's what you're doing right now. So you got to give a shit about what you're doing in that moment until you get to the place where you can do what you feel is your expertise or what you really would like to be doing. That's all the point is. I agree wholeheartedly. 100%. So you like, you like, you like my long-winded answers? I do, actually, because, you know, as I said, it's interesting. I mean, it's the fans are going to love this. The listeners are going to love it. And um, Well, I, I do get crazy and on tangents, but hey, I'm ADD. I can't help it. So so am I. You know, I, I can relate to you. Like, my last guest was has has it as well, and we talked about it. You know, it doesn't bother me at all. 
So oh, it, I'm totally ADD. But you know something? When I have to focus, when I really do have to focus in on something, I am able to do that. And um, I think that's probably why I like the structure of, like, being on tour and having a schedule because then I know, like, okay, I have to be here at a certain time. I have to do this at a certain time. And I find that it gives me a reason and a point of focus to do things. Yeah. Where left to, left to my own devices, I become scatterbrained. Yeah, it's true. You need you need somebody to put that order in to uh, give you a reason to really focus, right? Right. Well, you you need structure. Uh, uh, people generally need structure. Human beings, as a, as as a whole, I think, generally speaking, need some kind of form and structure in their lives to mm-hmm. adhere to. That's why we have fences. That's why we have rules. That's why we have laws. I mean, all these things are, you know, they're there to help govern us, if you will, because most people can't self-govern. Some people are very self-disciplined and very good about their own time management and everything they do. Probably more people are not. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you do need that structure, that little kick in the butt to say, okay, let's get things rolling. Um, Yeah. So in the, the final thing I just really wanted to know from you, uh, and then just hang on the line for just one quick second afterwards is do you have anything to say? Like if you could say one thing to all of the kiss army, let's say they're all listening right now, what would it be like your message to all the fans? Wow. Um, Cause there's so many things you can say, but I always, I mean, ultimately I think that they're like, unlike any other fans in the world. And I don't say this just to be, to give some, canned generic answer but it's really true I've, i'll just say this i've met a lot of great people from being in kiss that were kiss fans um that have become personal friends with me that are in my life as a friend and as uh, you know that have been part of my life that i've been able to share some great experiences with that i think is really cool that i'm very thankful for um i think it's a unique group and breed if you will, of people yeah. that ha- that have this common bond and common thread um, that speak a, a universal language to them. And uh, I just think it's, you know, it's a unique band and it brings unique people as fans to the band because of that. Um, and I think there's something about KISS that a lot of people identify in, um, because KISS was always so different, I think if people are in, the, in different individuals or feel like they're different than the norm, um, that somehow they feel that that's their band that they relate to because KISS is so different. And KISS has been a very polarizing band, band at times on many levels. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that a lot of people relate to that in their own personal life. Absolutely. It, and it, it, it just, it's so interesting because it bonds people so tightly and so well um, than any, any other band. So I agree with you. I think Kiss fans are some of the most loyal fans in music. Oh, no, they, no, they, they, no, they, they are. I mean, I know that other bands. Look, I played with Alice Cooper and played with Brian May from Queen, and I knew. So I know what it's like to be exposed to Queen fans. Uh, you know, the really diehard ones, Alice Cooper fans, Black Sabbath fans. Um, you know, I've worked with some of those bands, so I know a little of, I've had a taste of some of that too. And they have a, a lot of similarities. Their diehard fan base as well. Very similar, mm-hmm. very similar. Um, it goes back to that statement I made earlier about the same actor, I mean, same movie, different actors, yeah. the same thing. You know, basically you're talking about a band and music and the relationship of the fans to them and how obsessive or zealous some of them can be. But Kiss fans are different in a way that because it really, I mean, that's why you have an army and now a navy too. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if we're ever going to get an Air Force. I th- well, you do have the Kiss Jet. Yeah, but I'm talking about like something that's related, you know, some kind of experience. You know, I always thought it'd been cool. We t- we discussed it before. I always thought it'd been cool. I mean, mind you, we sometimes we just come up with ideas and throw shit out there to think of different things to do. And I remember, you know, talking about it, like it'd be cool to do like a Kiss experience on a jet. Um, you know, like a meet and greet package. I know that. Um, what do you call it? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Mick Fleetwood. Fleetwood Mac. Mm-hmm. He has a meet and greet package where you fly on his private jet with him and you hang out with him, go shopping or something. Uh, you'd have, if, you, if you look it up online, you probably can find it by Googling it and then find out exactly what's included or what the whole details are. But 
I remember when I first heard about it, I brought it up to, to Gene about like, hey, you know, this might be a cool thing. Find some way to do a special package where, you know, you know, you get to fly around and travel with Kiss. I mean, they've done auctions for charities where one of the auction prizes was you fly with Kiss and go to the show and hang out with them. And we've had people come on the plane and do that, that were done for these, um, uh, you know, different charity events. Um, yeah. They weren't things that were advertised per se on Kiss Online, for example. They were done at a charity, like we did a charity event a few months ago for Tommy Thayer's father for the, that military museum that they're building in Portland, Oregon, named after Tommy's dad. Um, they offer different packages like that there. That would be a kind of a, that would be a scenario where they would offer that kind of a package. But, okay. um, but I always thought it'd be cool if somehow they could have like, you know, like Iron Maiden, you know, Bruce, Ding, Bruce Dickinson flies their jet. He's a pilot. Yeah, that's he, really cool. He's, he's been a commercial pilot flying people, you know, flying, uh, he would fly commercial routes from London down to South Africa um, when he wasn't on tour. I don't know mm -hmm. if a lot of people know that, but he actually did. Um, for but fun. he flies there. He, I'm sorry. I said for fun. Well, he did it, but he was flying for a commercial airline. He wasn't flying just on his own. He was flying like I forget which airline it was. He was going to tour. Maybe it was was it British Midlands or I don't remember the name of the airline because I remember talking to him about it once, and I thought it was so cool that he did, that he would do it. Another guy that flew commercially like that was also um, Steve Morris that plays in Deep Purple, the guitar player from Dixie Drakes. He was a commercial pilot for a while too on and off That's um, awesome. when he wasn't touring. But I thought it'd be cool if you had a big plane like what Iron Maiden does, but they, you know, they fly all their gear and the whole band and everything on to, when they were on tour and Bruce is the pilot. How crazy is that? But <laughs> I think it'd be cool if Kiss did something like, okay, we're going to do a leg of a tour. We're going to have like a big seven. I don't, I don't know the plane numbers because I'm bad with that, but like a regular like commercial type jet where you have, you know, Everybody flies with Kiss and the band, and you fly to you know to South America, and you fly around to the whole tour just for that leg of the tour. You or you, or you only do it to you know it have to be something like that where you could make it work because it's very expensive to rent a jet to lease it. Yeah, that's pricey. Um, it's super. It's oh, it's super expensive. Um, but I think it'd be really cool to do some unique experience like that. Uh, the problem is, is to make it work and the cost financially to people that wanted to do that, it'd probably be really like crazy, crazy, ridiculous expensive. Yeah. It costs a lot. And you know, the meet and greets are, are people complain about that. But if you did, if you guys did that, it would be, uh, it would be cool for the fans who are privileged. We could say that it sounds like a cool well, idea though. Yeah. But I don't look at it like privilege because I look at it like, you know, I think Paul said it best. It's something that a band and other bands, all bands do it now, as you know, or most, mm -hmm. almost all bands do it these meet and greet packages, it's like, it's not for everybody. If you want to do it or if you can afford it, cool. But don't be offended to be going, oh, that's ridiculous that I should have to pay to meet my band. Well, just speaking for myself personally, like I said earlier in our conversation, mm -hmm. I never cared about meeting a band. So I never even cared about meeting them for free. So let alone paying for it. So to me, it's like, I'm not offended by whether a band does something like, like that or not. The only thing I am offended is if a band does do it, make sure it's a cool experience and you're giving them a good bang for the buck. And I don't think any band does what Kiss does, no. where they play acoustically and do it like we do it. Nobody does that. And other bands, and some people charge more for their meet and greet experience. Yeah, that's and, insane. And they don't give their fans what Kiss gives their fans. I'm not making a uh, judgment either way on any other band to do what they want. It's their choice to run their meet and greet and give them what they can or feel that they want to give of their time and effort. But I do know that what we do is very unique and very cool. Doing that acoustic thing like that for people, I don't know any other band that, Maybe you do, but I don't know of anybody that does does it the way Kiss does it. No way. No, no. You guys have definitely. I mean, having experienced it firsthand, it is um, it is the absolute best. I mean, seeing your favorite band performing acoustic for you in front of you, it's incredible. And the thing is, it's cool. We don't play songs there that are in the electric show, so you really do get like your own little mini concert of songs that you're not going to hear. And so when we go back and 
and get ready and make up, and then you come and take your photo, and then you go and see the band, what we play on stage is like, oh, okay, nothing to do musically, song-wise, with what we just did that day. It's not like, oh, well, they already played half those songs. No, we don't do that. Yeah, and I've, heard, um, I've even heard you guys say no to playing certain songs because you're going to play them later that night. Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, generally, the whole idea is like, you're supposed to get a different thing here than you did that you then you're going to get later in the day. I mean, it's, it's just to make it like a cool experience and a unique experience. And that kind of came out from us doing, you know, the MTV Unplugged or that those, I should say the Kiss Conventions, because that was what spawned MTV Unplugged. The Kiss Conventions, um, the Kiss Conventions served a lot of purpose in a lot of ways for a lot of blueprint for things that Kiss did going forward. Maybe he didn't recognize it at, at the time. It just kind of happened that way. But playing this unplugged format, more stripped down, I mean, it made me rethink how I play. Um, because when we started doing, when we did that convention tour, earlier in the day, Bruce Kulik and I would each do like a drum clinic. He did a guitar thing, and I'd have a big double bass drum set like I was playing at the time on tour with Kiss. Yeah. But when we, went to do, when we went to do the unplugged stuff, we stripped the drum kit down to a small kit with one bass drum, and, and we played the stuff very more back to basics, if you will. And that was like a conscious effort on, on all of our parts. We kind of said, well, because in some of the songs we had to learn because we had never played them, for, especially for Bruce and I. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I remember saying to Bruce, you know, we should kind of like uh, um, maybe start playing the songs a little bit more, kind of like the way they were played originally on the records or on a live one or two. And um, even when we played like, um, we even started playing a lot of the older songs at that time. We did, I remember we did a gig around that time for Foundations Forum, and we played a lot of more older songs at that point. And as, when, I, when I was going to learn them, um, I started like listening to the original rec recordings and the live records and started going, okay, you know, I think I should more play it more to those of style. Because when I joined the band, I came in at a time and replaced Eric Carr. Yeah. Kiss was playing the songs in a certain style, playing them very fast. Yeah, very quick, yeah. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, for me to learn the material and kind of play them or play with Kiss, or I don't want to say in a Kiss style, because I'm trying to figure the right way to phrase it, but the way Kiss was playing their own songs at that point in time, in like 1990, 91, they were not playing them like they did in the 70s. No. So... When I went to learn the songs, I was given, like, I would go and reference, like, um, the studio tracks from Eric Carr, the studio tracks from Peter, the live tracks of Peter playing them, the live versions of Eric Carr playing them. And I had to kind of go, okay, let me kind of play some kind of combination of what these guys were all doing. And then taking into consideration how Kiss as a band was playing and approaching their own material in 1990 or 91, whatever it was, 92, when we did Revenge Tour. Okay. So, um, you know, and it was very common at that time for a lot of drummers to play more busy with a lot of flash, and, you know, kind of almost overplaying, throwing in a lot of double bass. That was kind of the standard, if you will, of how a lot of drummers or most drummers were playing in most bands. So I kind of was just basically, it was a sign of the times and I was following suit. But then... You know, a couple of years later, I started, like, as we started doing a lot of older material that the band hadn't played in a while, when I would go to learn it, I started listening to more of the studio versions, which are different, a lot different. If you listen to, the, for example, the first three Kiss records and then listen to a live one, the way Peter, for example, plays, he does not even play remotely the same as he did on the record. Yeah, very live. different. Very different. And um, so... When I would go to learn stuff, I'd go, okay, well, I kind of got to take a little essence of both things and then take into consideration the way Eric Carr was playing it as well and try to make some kind of a blend of it all and then also, at the same time, make it my own or put a little of my own personality in there too. So that's kind of what I was trying to figure out or what was going through my head. Okay. And um, But then as time went on, I started going, well, you know, I think I should play it more stripped down overplaying and playing a bunch of double bass. Yes, if you're a drummer, you're going to go, wow, that's fucking cool. Listen to that. But when you take the whole body of the audience into consideration, 
most people are not drummers. Most people don't know the difference of something being technical or cool or not. They don't. They just know, I like Kiss, I want to hear the Kiss song. Yeah. And you got to kind of, you know, it's almost like, it'd be like as all of a sudden I was playing an ACDC and I started throwing a bunch of extra stuff in there. Most people would not want to hear it played that way. They want it more closer to the records and more simplified the way Phil Rudd plays which is great. He plays great, but he plays in a simplified way because that's what suits ACDC's music. So I tried to take into consideration playing a little bit more, I don't know, re respectful, if you will, yeah. or co conscious, if you will. I'm trying to think of the right words to use. Not as much double bass. Well, just playing it more simplified and more straighter ahead. And I started doing that by, if you... All you have to do is watch MTV Unplugged, and that was in August of 95, way before the reunion tour, um, way before I ever came back and played or put on makeup or any of that stuff. I already had kind of, I call it a seasoned, mature approach, if you want. Yeah. Some people might, they might want to call it boring. Okay, if that's what you want to call it, you decide how you want to, how you want to view it. But I made that own, my own conscious effort to be a little more simplified and try to play more mature and more for the song, because I realized, you know, the guys that always get hired, the guys that always get the gigs, the guys that always work are the guys that play what an artist wants and always play for the song. They're not mm -hmm. playing a bunch of dig me looks like, hey, dig me over here. We know a lot of fans and some people like that kind of stuff, but usually just drummers like it. I find that you need to always be conscious of playing for the song. Be respectful of that. And in the long run, it will serve you better. And that's really all that it was always about for me was serving the music in a way that I felt was better. Maybe other people see it differently, have a different opinion of that. But that's, I'm just telling you how I see it yeah. and why I made that conscious effort. So when I came back to play in the band in 2001 with Ace and Gene and Paul, it was no problem for me to just slide right back in and kind of approach the music in a more simplified way. And mm -hmm. the bottom line is, let's face it, that's what they were doing. Gene and Paul weren't playing their own Kiss songs in, on the reunion tour the way they were playing them with Bruce and I anymore. No, and they went it. back. They yeah. went back and said, okay, how did we play them originally? Yeah, and, and Peter was in there in the first place, and, and, and he was playing the way he did on those first three records. It's not like he was trying to play it the way you did. Well, yeah, but well... When Peter came back and did the in the reunion tour, Peter does not play on the reunion tour the way he played like on a live one. No, um, and that's what you have to use for an example because the way they played live versions of their songs is what um, kind of was the template, if you will, for Kiss. So if you want to go by the early Kiss, you'd say a live one and a live two. Those live versions is kind of the template of how the songs were played by everybody. I don't mean just Peter. I mean by the whole band. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a template that they created for themselves. But I find it interesting that um, Peter doesn't play from 96 onward like he did on a live one or two. No, it's a lot more stripped I'm down. I'm talking about his drum parts. No, he plays much more simplified, even more simplified. Um, so, you know, it, everybody's playing evolves in different ways. I'm not saying that as a commentary or, or, uh, criticism. I'm saying that it's just a commentary on, on how he approached it. That's where he was at playing wise. And or maybe in his head, the way he hear, heard it and said, Hey, this is how I'm going to approach it. Or this is how I play now. I don't know. I can't speak for him, but I just noticed that it was very different than the seventies his seventies approach, but you have to be fair. I mean, when you're a younger guy, myself included, I'm like, I told you earlier, I'm 56 years old. I can't play to the intensity that I did when I was 26 or 36 years old, mainly because I'm not a younger guy like that. But also for me, I sing so much that if I didn't have to sing, I would be able to play much more physical, more like okay. I did when I was younger because I didn't sing very much then. But now I sing on all the songs all the time. I, and I do all these high harmonies that are really, um, they count on me and rely on me to do that. So my responsibility in KISS is different than it was when I was in the band 20 years ago.
Well, and yeah. I and I approach my drumming and everything catering to what my responsibilities are in the band now, which, like I said, are different than they were 20 years ago. So I have to take that into consideration. That gets factored into the equation of how I'm going to play. And because I have to sing so much and have my head turned over and leaning and singing into a microphone, I can't play the same way if I, as if I had no microphone there. It just really does change my playing. Um, when I played with Alice Cooper, I didn't even sing at all. So mm -hmm. I was able to be much, much more freer with the drumming because I didn't have to worry about breathing. And, you know, when you're playing really physical and high energy, man, you're, you're practically out of breath all the time. Yeah. Try, singing, try singing when you're like that. You can't. So you have to kind of like pace yourself, if you will. And you kind of got to back it down a little bit so you go, hey, I got to be able to breathe. I have to be able to sing. Um, you know, the ironic thing is when I used to play when I wasn't singing and I played more physical, I would lose my voice all the time. I'd lose my voice every night from like grunting and stuff when I was playing and playing. You'd be like, ah, 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 you know, you're really <laughs> grunting and stuff when you're playing. I would lose my voice. And people say like, how come you're losing your voice and you're not even singing? I go, I know it's <laughs> weird, but I'm always grunting. And a lot of times I'm humming along. I'm humming the guitar part. I'm humming the melody. Um, that's what I do when I'm playing all the time. I'm always kind of singing the riffs or singing the parts because I'm playing along to those riffs. Um, okay. I don't know. It's, for me, it just helps me musically. Uh, how I, it's just how I play live. Um, but I found, wow, I can't do this if I have to sing all the time because you're going to lose your voice. So you got to kind of do what? You need to kind of back it down a few, few notches. And when I started doing that and being conscious about breathing, I found, oh, okay, I'm not losing my voice now. I mean, to me, Cassius, the kids shows are about, it's always about, I spend 22 hours of every day planning for the couple hours that we're going to be on stage. That's what it's about for me. Mm -hmm. Everything I do, my sleep, my rest, travel, um, maintenance, eating, everything, it's all about, based about getting prepared to be able to do that show. And then once you do the show, the cycle starts all over again. And that's to me how it works. That's how I approach playing. And when your responsibilities are different in a band, depending on what your requirements are, like I said, if you're a singing drummer, you do have to approach it a little differently than as opposed to if you just play drums. It's a lot easier to just play drums, believe me. A lot easier. Yeah, because it's, it's um, now you have so much responsibility. And, you know, it's, it's like you said, 20 years and now a microphone, that's going to make a difference to anyone. Oh, yeah. And believe me, I like singing. I enjoy it. I, I like being able to, you know, I like doing it. I like to be able to feel like I help the band or add to it, whatever you want to call it. I mean, and I accept the responsibility. But I also know, <clears throat> just like everybody, as you get older, it gets harder to harder to be so high energy, harder to sing high, to sing in a high register. All that stuff gets hard. It gets harder to do. It of just course. does. Yeah, without a doubt. And I mean, you guys, are, you guys are only human. You guys portray superheroes on stage. That's how your fans see you. But at the end of the day, it's like you said earlier, open that curtain. It's people. You guys are people and you're doing your job. And, uh, you know, personally, as a fan, I want to say thank you to, to you and, and all you guys for doing such a kick-ass job of, continuing something that's so special to so many people. Well, you know, thank, I can only thank you on my own and thank you for everybody else. But, hey, the bottom line is we wouldn't do this if we didn't want to do it. Nobody yeah. has to be here. I mean, we do it because it's, I, I think it's, it's ingrained in all of us. It's part of our DNA to be in a band, to play music and be musicians and or entertainers, whatever you want to call it. Some people are more of an entertainer. Some people are more of a musician, but at the end of the day, um, I think it's a, a, I'm very blessed and it's a real privilege to get to do that. The fact that I'm able to do something that I always wanted to do my whole life and aspired to do, that doesn't suck. I mean, yeah. and I, I would, I hope all I can is I wish everybody have the opportunities in their life to be able to realize their dreams or aspirations to do what they would like to do for a living, whether it's being a painter, an artist, a carpenter, you know, a policeman, whatever it is, if that's what you aspire to do, I hope you get to realize your dreams because that's what makes the world go round. That's what makes the life better because then it puts you in a position where then you can turn around, you get to give something back to people. You get to help 
you may, hey, bottom line is what we get to do is really great because it makes a lot of people happy. It brings a lot of joy and, and, uh, and, and uh, satisfaction to other people's lives. That's great. And then it also puts you in a position to do nice things, charitable things, help others, you know, you know, and you don't always have to be in the public about that stuff, but it does give you the opportunity and hopefully everyone that gets in a position of uh, being able to be charitable and give back to the world or to whatever it is that's important to them. Hopefully they all do that. Yeah. Because, you know, all these people have helped afford me and all of us a really nice life because of being in this band that everybody loves so much. I mean, I, if you'd have told me when I was a little kid, I was going to get to play and kiss and do all this stuff. I'd have probably said, no way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd be I, at that time. But like I said, you know, there was some, something drove me from being a kid that said, you need to pursue this because if you really pursue it and really give it a, a shot, you can do it. And so that's the hope that I give or hopefully pass on to everybody. If you feel something inside of you that feels you, that you're driven to want to try to pursue or do, you got to go for it. Um, my mother told me when I was probably your age, Cassius, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I remember her telling me this. She said, you know, usually the people are that are successful in life are the ones that take the chances. And it's people that take the gamble to try to go for their dreams. And, go and you have to go for it knowing it may not work out the way you want, but it may lead you on a different path that takes you in a different journey in life that may surprise you. But you still owe it. Everybody owes it to themselves to give anything they really want to do. Give it a shot. Yes, you may not make it happen, but you've got to at least – it's better to try and, not, and know, know the answer rather than to go, well, I could have really tried or I should have or – or then everybody has the built-in excuse. Well, you know, I couldn't, I wasn't able to make it because I had a kid and I had to do this and my, you know, my dog got sick and, you know, everybody has all these, uh, these outs, if you will. Instead of going, no, I'm going to go for it. And then realize, realize your potential. In other words, and if it doesn't work out, at least you go, you know something, I did give it a shot. It just didn't work out, but that's cool. At least I know that I gave it a shot. Mm -hmm. It's better to, you know, better to try. My mother told me, man, people, people get it, People get success in life that take the chances. And I always remember that. And that's what made me like pack everything up from Cleveland, Ohio, and driving my car across the country to California and go, hey, I'm going to give this a shot because I think I can do it. And you, it starts, it starts within yourself. You just have to find that drive and then get the get the gumption to go for it. Yeah, at least go for it. And like you said, even if it doesn't work out the way you planned it, go for it. That's what I'm going to do with stand-up comedy. I'm going to I'm I live 5 minutes from a comedy club. I'm going to do an open mic and I'm just going for it. And that's it's just what you have to do. I completely agree with you. You are 100% right. And you know something? You know, hey, everybody develops at a different rate and at a different place. You know, there's no rules. Remember that. Just like rock and roll, there's no rules. Everybody some people are late bloomers. I mean, to me, I was a late bloomer. You know, I didn't move to LA until I was 25. And I finally got in a band. I was 26 when I finally got in a band that was touring. That's not old, but by, by uh, a lot of industry stand, I remember at that time, a lot of guys that were in bands were 18, 19, 20, 21. They were all playing in, you know, local bands and on the LA scene at that time. This was like 83, 84. They were already like had been doing it you know, half their lives at that time. They were brought up in this culture of this whole LA music scene. And I could see that they were way more developed and knowledgeable and experienced in the whole thing than I was. Mm -hmm. But because I, you know, I came out here very green, but, but if you open your ears and you open your eyes, you'd be surprised how much you can learn very quickly. If you're a quick study and you pay attention, you can, you can like, uh, accelerate very quickly. Yeah, just being and, around uh, the whole environment, right? You got to immerse yourself into the in, into the whole dynamic and the environment. That you know, they say you got to be in it to win it. It's true. You have to really. You can't just watch music on TV or listen to it on a record player. You got to do it. You got to play your instrument. Play with the greatest thing is playing with other people. You learn so much in such a quick time when you interact with other people. Playing with people is 
and you get 10 times the benefit than you would as if you were playing along to the record or the radio on your own. Just that interaction, that exchange between people, because then it, it, it makes you really more aware of what it is to play together with people as opposed to playing along to a record. Yeah, it's a different dynamic. Like, I've done it once or twice, like, with Justice, me and him play a lot. And it's even just the two of us, we see each other's face light up, and it, you can see the uh, how different it is. Well, it's, and it's the same thing when you perform. You know, that it, that interaction between an audience and a, and a and stage, that's that's the greatest high that there is. There's, honestly, if they could package that up, as a drug or in a drink that you could drink, <laughs> everybody would want it because it's like that is the most when you're when adrenaline and endorphins kick into your body that your brain creates, mm-hmm. it creates this unique experience that only you'll fully fully appreciate and understand it unless you've actually experienced it. Like being on stage, it, you know, there's that instant gratification. You play a song, the crowd cheers. It's a very unique thing, and it's hard to really put it into words. It's not a tangible thing that you can bottle up or grab. You know, you can try to explain it to people, but the only thing is to really experience it. That's what you need to do. And everybody's had a little bit of it when they played sports or gone to a show. I mean, the, the adrenaline that you feel as a fan looking up on stage and seeing the band when the first curtain opens up and you see your band for the first time and you, that rush you get and that euphoria. But you can imagine how it is for the, 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 uh, the band on stage. When they're looking out at 10, 20, 30,000 people and all of a sudden you're going, wow, it's very intense. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And especially when you're st- like, I see you when you do your solo. I don't know if you still do it this c- coming tour, but you, you know, you'll point at one side of the of the venue. They all go crazy. Wherever you point, they go crazy. And, you know, I saw you do that at Rock M Ring. Like, the, I just imagine. Well, you know, put it this way. What was that? That's an old cliche. That's an old cliche. Every drummer does that. Yeah, I, don't, yeah. I think I, yeah, how many drummers I've seen do that and myself, I'm guilty of it. Yeah, that's like an old cliche thing that so many drummers do, but <laughs> you know something? It's, it's very powerful. It's yeah. like, it's like a, it's like a leader standing at a podium in front of a crowd and giving a speech and pointing to the crowd and getting, you know, cheering them on or raising them up. It's, 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 it's an empowering position to be in and feeling to experience. Um, I don't do drum solos anymore. I haven't done them in a long time. And honestly, I don't care if I ever do do them because to me, I think it's, I'd rather have us play songs and put on a show than get people a reason to go to the bathroom. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that makes sense. So, so you're not going to be doing the thing with Tommy on this coming tour in South America? No, 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 we haven't, we haven't, no, we haven't been, we stopped doing that. We didn't do that this year. We, we, you know, like you can only do it so long and it got, to me, it's like, it got played out, but, um, uh, I personally don't care about drum solos. Even unless I'm going to see a band, like if I'm going to see Billy Cobham, mm-hmm. I'm going to see Billy Cobham because he's this one of these drummer guys that that's what he does. He's a uh, he's known for that. If you go when I go see most rock bands, I don't care about the, the guitar player or anyone doing a solo. I mean, think about this: when Gene does his thing, it's not really a bass solo; it's a performance piece. Yeah. He's, Really, he's doing a performance. It's it's a reason to spit blood and to fly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And for you, it was so, the bazooka. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, to me, I came up with the bazooka thing because I thought, okay, we need something that's a kiss kind of a thing. And I thought, that's a kiss kind of a thing. Um, and Gene and Paul thought the same thing. They thought it was cool. And But, uh, you know, I think it kind of got, to me, it's like, okay, we did it for a while. It got played out. I don't think it's something that needed to be uh, part of a KISS show forever. Um, but people do want to see Gene. You, put it this way. You want to see Gene just sit up there and play his bass? No. You want to see Gene spit blood <laughs> and act crazy and then fly. I mean, I mean, when you think about it, people always think that everybody in KISS like this, there's these, these four characters that somehow take on this persona. And I thought, you know, when you really think about it, the only one that really takes on some kind of a persona, if you will, or alter ego, is really Gene. Gene turns into like this demon, this character that's stalking around the stage, making these faces, sticking his tongue out, spitting blood. I mean, to me, Gene's the one that's really in in character, if you will. When I think about um, like the original band back in the day, I didn't think there was, in other words, 
Gene acts like this Dean character. Peter didn't act like a cat. No. Ace didn't act like some. Ace didn't act like an alien or some space guy. He he just said, "I'm the spaceman," <laughs> based on the costume and stuff. You know, I remember the early costume had like these rings, like almost looked like Saturn rings around his parts of his costume. So he had this kind of futuristic kind of look or something out of maybe a 50s sci-fi or something like that. But he never had, in other words, his performance on stage was not of like some spaceman or the only one that to me, this is just my own point of view and perspective. When I thought about it, I thought, wow, the only one that ever really was kind of a character of those characters that they labeled themselves with back then was Gene. Yeah, and, and, you know, other than Paul having the star in his eye, he didn't walk around with, like, throwing ninja stars or anything. Like, it was just, you know, it's just what they called him. Yeah, well, they called him either the, you know, either he was star child or sometimes they referred to him as, like, the lover, yeah. whatever, um, in the early days. But um, to me, when I think about the four names that were associated or characters with the guys, the only one, to me, that when you really think about it, that was in character, as they say. What I mean is, like, I, I look at what Gene does is, like, performance art. He's, like, in character. Mm -hmm. He becomes, like, this demon guy on stage. Nobody else ever kind of, to me, got into in character, per se. Paul, to me, was always, like, just this great front man that was, like, you know, was great on stage. I mean, I never saw anybody other than Prince, who I always think might have been influenced by Paul Stanley a little bit, Okay. The only guy I've ever the only guy I've ever seen with a guitar around their neck the whole time that could really be a real dynamic front and, and performer with the guitar on the whole time, mind you. The only one I ever saw Paul Stanley and Prince. When I watch Prince, I think to myself, you know, I always thought this, even from especially the early days. I always thought, you know, Prince kind of reminds me a little of Paul Stanley. The way he kind of, some of his stage moves and some of the movement, I'm talking about with the guitar. When he mm -hmm. takes the guitar off, then it's kind of like James Brown, Jackie Wilson, all those classic R&B guys, you know, and early rock guys. I mean, there's a little bit of Little Richard and, yeah. you know, some of that stuff, James Brown, especially James Brown. But um, when I read, but when I see him with the guitar and how he is with, as a performer running around and stuff, other than Paul Stanley, those are the only two guys, in my opinion, that ever really could front a band and have a guitar on their neck the whole time. Because usually, I don't like the lead singer having a guitar on all night long. I don't like it. Because yeah. it, it restricts them. For, it restricts them. I mean, could you imagine Mick Jagger with a guitar on all night or Alice Cooper? No. Yeah, that'd be weird. Or, you know, any of those guys, or Steven Tyler, any of these guys that are, like, dynamic frontmen? No. Iggy Pop, Bowie? No. But, when I, but... Paul's always had a guitar on and Prince most of the time has a guitar on and he's, man, he's a badass guitar player. He is. Um, he's incredible. He's, and yeah, I do see how he, how he could be influenced by Paul, you know, all these great front men, they've got to take a page from each other. Oh, absolutely. But I definitely think that, you know, anyone that plays guitar that wants to be a front man, if you want to think like, well, how could I do it and be a real performer and be dynamic? You just got to watch Paul Stanley because he's probably done it the best. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, because that's that's so restrictive for in every aspect to have a guitar hung around your neck and try to run around. I mean, you watch especially some of that early videos of Paul, the way he would how how he would jump around and bang his head around and stuff like that with that guitar on. Uh, it's unbelievable. That's why I said he's he's one of the greatest frontmen. Um, there's no doubt about it. He is. And everybody has everybody has all their favorite or personal lists of who they like as frontmen. Uh, and different eras of stuff, you know, David Lee Roth and Jagger and Rod Stewart and all that stuff. And I like it all too. But I still think what Paul did, be, what Paul did and has done with a guitar on his neck the whole time, uh, no, but there's nobody that's done it like that. Nobody. He changed it forever, I think, too. Yeah. Well, there just hasn't been anyone. There hasn't been anyone like them. The only one I, like I said, Prince is the only one other guy that I've ever seen that really was is dynamic and all over the place. And I mean, I mean what I mean is performing. I mean physical, mm -hmm. being able to be physically really dynamic, running around and doing stuff, but with a guitar on. Paul Stanley's the only guy I ever saw really do it like that of a hard rock band guy. I mean, it's just you know, 
there just hasn't been anyone like him other than Prince. Absolutely. And Prince, is, and Prince doesn't always have the guitar on, where Paul always does, always has. What can I say? You guys are professionals. You know, Kiss is the real deal. Um, and, you know, I've always been proud to be a Kiss fan. Uh, you know, it's um, it's a huge part of my life. And I, I again, I'll thank you for co- being so generous with your time and calling in. You know, I expected oh, a half hour and having two oh, and no, a half. Ca- catches, I don't mind. I mean, look, honestly, I don't do that much interview stuff like this too much. Um, uh, you know, I do a handful. I mean, we do interviews with other foreign countries to do promo for tours coming up and with different magazines and formats and stuff like that along the way. But when it comes to people doing blogs and things like that, I don't do them that often um, anymore. But if there are people that I'm friends with um, or have a relationship with, like on that kind of a level, then I don't mind doing it once in a while. I just said, I don't think there's, you can't do it too often because then it becomes just, you know, redundant. And yeah. everybody's, you know, I guarantee you there's a lot of people that are going to hear this that go, oh, I've heard that answer before, and I've already heard people ask them that question, and we know that. Um, but there's other people that they haven't heard these questions, and they don't know these answers, and it's new information to them. Mm-hmm. So you have to, you kind of got to be a little um, mindful of that, if you will. Yeah, of course, and, and I think it's, it's a different dynamic when um, when when it's an f- actual fan, like who follows the band, who knows what they're talking about. Uh, instead of just some guy from uh, some other show who's just doing it to get the, the listeners. So I do appreciate you taking the time. Uh, hang on for just one second here, and uh, no problem. We'll, we'll get a plug. And thank you guys for listening. This is Cassius Morris, a.k.a. That Reporter Kid, saying rock on. 